Uh, I'm Melissa Winnie, the Executive Director here at E2 Tech. Uh, I'd like to start off just thanking you all for coming this morning. Um, we have a really exciting session planned, so I'm excited to, to get this started. Um, thank you to all of our speakers for agreeing to uh, participate on the panel. Um, I'd also like to send a thank you out to two members of our program committee who uh, really led the way in developing some of the content for this. So thank you to Tom Eschner and Jeremy Fink uh, for helping to organize this. <laughs> and so this is a, a unique forum for us in that uh, we, have a, we were able to offer it for free. So I'd like to also thank our supporting partner for this, the Horizon Foundation, uh, for allowing us to do that. Uh, as well as our silver sponsors for today's forum. Uh, we have TRC, VHB, Revision Energy, BioBase Main, Main Biz, and Main Green Power. Uh, and both Revision Energy and BioBase Main have tables in the back, so if you weren't able to talk with them earlier, uh, feel free to stop by after the, the panel. Uh, if you're interested in sponsoring any of our forums, there's information up on our newly designed website. Um, and you can also feel free to, to reach out to me and, and we can talk about the different options. Um, along that same line, I know a lot of you are members. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, if you are not yet a member, again, please feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to talk through the, the member benefits with you. And there's also information uh, up on our website. Uh, with that, uh, we'll get started. So this panel, uh, we brought together a, a group of climate science, economics, and industry experts to talk about the economic impacts of climate change here in Maine. Um, we are lucky to have Dr. Ivan Fernandez of the UMaine Climate Change Institute and School of Forestry, uh, who will both be presenting today as well as moderating the session. Uh, among a variety of other honors and awards. Ivan was made Distinguished Maine Professor in 2007, <coughs> Professor of the Year for Maine in 2008, uh, was named a Fellow in the Soil Science Society of America in 2010, and was the 2018 President's Public Service Achievement Award recipient at UU Maine. Uh, he served on various US Environmental Protection Agency Science Advisory Board Committees in DC, and currently chairs a panel of the EPA Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee. Uh, he represents the University of Maine in the USDA Northeast Climate Hub and has been involved in leading the Maine's climate future assessments in 2009 and 2015. Uh, he is a soil scientist and is actively engaged in promoting climate adaptation in the state. Um, so with that, I'll hand this over to Ivan and thank you all again for coming. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm not sure about the invitation to be moderator. We'll see how good I do on that. Um, but uh, no, I really look forward to it. It's a, an exciting topic. Of course, probably everyone in the room, I'm guessing, has been to climate change talks. And so what's exciting about this is, um, sure, it's talking about a really important topic for our planet and for our future. Um, but it's also getting at some of the practical aspects of this issue, which is uh, economic uh, pragmatic concerns that affect us uh, every day. And uh, as you'll see in a minute, uh, I'm particularly, particularly interested in that uh, as it pertains uh, to, to Maine. So uh, let's get started. Um, we've all seen figures uh, like this. Uh, this is from the uh, Global Carbon Project, which produces a report every year, sort of giving us an update and an assessment of progress relative to the carbon cycle. Um, and it shows a bunch of lines. Uh, and uh, the, the bold lines are various trajectories uh, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, future projections, RCP uh, 2.6 up to 8.5. Uh, and then all the spaghetti around it is kind of important, because that shows you that uh, we, we have lots of variability. Uh, in our, uh, our modeling capability at, at looking what the future is. Uh, but there's clear trends and directions that um, seem uh, irrefutable based on uh, our current understanding and, and the science. Uh, and that 
That particular figure also notes that uh, uh, we're basically on the highest trajectory uh, and, and pretty much continue to be there. Uh, the Paris Accord would bring us to sort of the second trajectory down, but of course uh, our country's currently trying to uh, back out of that, uh, that accord. That's not the focus of this morning's uh, discussion. So I think a lot about climate change, um, and I, I'm in the Climate Change Institute, and uh, some of my other work uh, deals with the changing chemical and physical climate and its impacts on ecosystems. Uh, but I'm particularly interested in Maine. And um, uh, what I, uh, I guess, uh, noted uh, a long time ago now, but about a dozen years ago, uh, there was a lot of activity in Augusta having to do with the development of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Uh, we had a main climate action plan that we did a pretty good job on that was uh, in force, technically is still in force. Uh, and there was a lot of activity uh, going on in Augusta, but by relatively few people. And then I'd go back to my other job, you know, uh, at the university, and I'd run around with all these world experts uh, dealing with uh, uh, climate change. And what I realized was just a little bit better communication between those two entities would go a long way. It benefits the scientists to understand what are the people around us and in our backyard and down in Augusta and in businesses and coastal communities struggling with, with what do they really want to know. Um, and likewise, uh, a lot of the science knowledge and the uncertainties that go with that knowledge uh, were embodied in all these scientists running around doing these things and, and they weren't communicating that back. So uh, about a, a decade ago, uh, I and a, uh, George Jacobson at the university led this initiative. Took a year, and the purpose of it was to assess uh, how climate is changing in Maine. Uh, we know what IPCC says is happening to the planet. We know what the national uh, climate programs say is happening to the United States. Um, but it's easy to ignore that when you're making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis because, you know, you've got to make payroll at the end of the week. Uh, and tomorrow morning, you know, you've got a problem to deal with. And what's happening out in the Pacific Ocean and 100 years from now seems pretty remote. Um, however, I was sort of passionate about the notion that I see the changing climate all around us and how it's impacting uh, Maine communities. So uh, about uh, 70 scientists contributed their time. This wasn't a funded effort. Go uh, the governor asked us uh, to do it at the time um, uh, after we proposed it. Uh, and we put out this report, Maine's Climate Future, and you can download it from the web uh, uh, from the Climate Change Institute uh, at the University of Maine. And uh, uh, in 2015, we did an update. Um, there's some hard copies in the back, but you also can download it from the Climate Change Institute's website. And the purpose of this was it, to uh, answer the question, is climate changing in Maine? And of course, probably everyone in the room uh, would answer that question, yes. And a lot more people now answer that question pretty quickly, yes, than when we came out with that report and I would give talks. And so uh, no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, uh, talking about the weather and the impacts has changed dramatically in the last uh, decade. So what did we learn? And each of us are going to talk for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes this morning, and then we're going to have a, a panel. Um, so I, I, as part of my comments, I wanted to uh, give you the Cliffs Notes uh, on the Maine Climate Future Report from 2015. And uh, this little table is the, the summation for all of the major in indicators, minus one. Uh, the, the first column there says last 100 years, and so that's information about how the climate has changed here in Maine in the last 100 years. These are real data. This is not speculative. These are measured data, measured by proxies. Some of it's reanalysis, which means you have three points and you fill in the point in the middle, but it's based on real data. So it's kind of irrefutable what those uh, trends are. The other column is projections that we included in the report to 2050. Um, we chose 2050. It doesn't give you as dramatic a curve if you go out to 2100, or if you want a really big curve, go out to 2300. Um, but 2050 is just around the corner. We're buying tractors and vehicles and making investments today that are being influenced by what we think the weather will be in 2050. And so we, that's why we chose that, uh, that target. Um, so what did we learn? Uh, no surprise, uh, over the last hundred years the temperature in Maine's warmed about three degrees Fahrenheit uh, and we expect it to warm by another one to three degrees Fahrenheit um, by 2050, middle of the century. Uh, the warm season, uh, which if you build highways it's the warm season, if you grow crops it's the growing season. 
whatever you want to call it, we know the, what we're talking about. Actually, at 6.06 .06 this morning, uh, we started the heart of it, which is called summer. Uh, it's the non-frozen season when we do a lot of things uh, here in Maine that we don't do uh, in the other part of, uh, of the season. Uh, it's gotten about two weeks longer, uh, and we expect two more weeks. And the, and the rate of change is accelerating in many of these uh, metrics. Uh, Maine's vacation land, you know, we don't have a lot of high heat index days. We only have a few, um, but we expect more of them, uh, and the increase is expected to be more along coastal uh, regions where, of course, uh, most of us, or a lot of us, live and play. Most of us play at some point. Um, precipitation has increased, and, uh, you know, if I gave a talk 15 years ago, I wouldn't have talked as much about uh, precipitation, the, the physical climate scientist. I'm not the uh, atmospheric physical kind of climate scientist. Uh, told us a long time ago that we would see this trend. And sure enough, we've seen this trend. We notice it most in these intense events. Um, that we get, uh, you know, lots of inches in one day, uh, breaking records all the time, which uh, we're doing. On average, we've gotten 13% more precipitation in the last century, uh, 5 to 10% more by 2050, and more to come after that. So there's no question we're on average getting wetter. Um, and it's warming, so we have less snow. On average, we have about 7% less snow uh, with dr probably dramatic increases, and there, there's uh, a lot of emerging interest in the changing winter uh, because uh, it's changing a lot. Uh, and some of that is kind of basic math. You know, the closer you get to 32 degrees, that's when stuff freezes. And so that's why coastal communities on the map on the right is going to potentially, you know, in this projection, be 40% less snow, whereas the interior is 25% less snow. Of course, we play a lot in the snow in the interior, so it kind of all matters. Ocean temperatures increasing. Uh, <coughs> you've probably heard on the reports, um, uh, the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the world's oceans. Um, we're, of course, going to get increased data on that, and it's going to change as you add more data, uh, so it won't be potentially as clear and sensational, it'll be 97% or 99%, but we're talking about a very rapidly warming Gulf of Maine that's having profound impacts. Um, and uh, on this list, finally, sea level rise, uh, about uh, six-tenths of a foot in the last century, with uh, more to come, uh, and the projections and the uncertainties on this are, are pretty large. Um, what's not on that is ocean acidification. Uh, again, we wouldn't have talked so much and thought about ocean acidification as much 15 years ago. Uh, now ocean acidification is a big deal. Why it wasn't on this is because we haven't had that much data on it. We haven't been monitoring it as intensively as we've monitored these others. But um, in other talks, I'll often, I have a closing slide that says if the only thing that was happening in the world was ocean acidification, we would have a world in crisis. And so that's just one more factor and one more component uh, of the changing climate. That's all interesting, um, but why do we care? You know, what are the effects in Maine? And so this is where I, I spend a lot of my time, you know, sort of my day job. I study biogeochemical response of ecosystems to a changing environment, uh, climate, acid rain, uh, other management I I impacts. Um, and so that's how I got started thinking a lot about how does this environment impact these ecosystems I'm studying in, we are all depending on, and many of us, uh, our livelihoods depend on it. Uh, and we, oh, what did I do? Oh, okay. Um, and this, this actually was an animated slide, but I just ruined that. So uh, those would slowly pop up, as I said. This is my sort of wheel of fortune. Uh, you can divide up the world any way you want, but you, you know the point here. We, if we think of agriculture, forestry, human health concerns, and I hate those things, um, marine fisheries, meaning those ticks, uh, municipalities, you know, businesses, supply chains, what have you, security, recreation, tourism. Um, you can have your own categories or slice and divide. All of those we could talk at length about how climate and the changing climate in Maine is a factor, not the only factor, almost ever, but is an important factor in how we're interacting, uh, how we're carrying out our day-to-day -day work, uh, and how it's going to impact us in the future with lots of economic intersections with those, uh, those kinds of concerns. We're going to hear about 
from experts uh, on this panel about the different aspects uh, of that, and um, that's the kind of uh, area that really animates me, uh, and that's the uh, kind of uh, connection to practical and economic concerns that I think we're maturing to uh, as we increasingly address the, the climate challenge. What do we do about it? Um, and the subtext there is, isn't that expensive? You know, of course, in the political debate, um, discourse, I don't mean the DC, let's not talk about the DC's political debate, but just in our discussions of how do we approach it uh, and various opinions that, that people can bring to the table, which are great. But we hear a lot of, yeah, but it's going to cost to do that. And right now, there's other concerns. Fair question. It's hard, though, to buy that if we actually look at the issue of climate change and what are our options. When I think about action, I think I divide it up into kind of an academic thing for me to do, but you know, that's my day job. Um, into mitigation and adaptation. What do we do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? And what do we do to be resilient and smart about addressing the climate impacts on uh, our systems? So let me talk about mitigation a little bit. Um, reducing greenhouse gases. I'm not going to talk about it very much. Um, there's a variety of studies and reports out there. This is from the US uh, Council on Economic Advisors in 2014, but the point being that mitigation costs increase on average approximately 40% for each decade of delay. The exact number is not important, but the point is the longer we wait, the more expensive it's getting. No question about that. Uh, and the longer we wait, the more we have to do both at once. We have to both invest in adaptation and we've got to be even more aggressive than before uh, on mitigation. The argument is if we put a price on carbon, for example, um, it's going to ruin the economy. I'm not an economist. We have some expertise here today. Ask the questions of the expertise. But um, I got to stop doing that. There we go. Um, but uh, one aspect of what I've done, as I said, is study the impacts of acid deposition, uh, sulfur and nitrogen deposition on ecosystems. Uh, and I've done that for most of my career. I've been involved with EPA and various panels. This was, I was part of this panel as well. It's not the one I'm uh, on right now. That evaluated the economic uh, benefits and costs of the Clean Air Act. And so in 1990, um, when I was a little bit younger, but still studying what I do today, um, we heard a lot about uh, if we put a price on sulfur, if we limit sulfur during the reauthorization of the Clean Air Act in 1990, it was going to have devastating effects on our economy, uh, and so we shouldn't do it. And the reality is it costs about $65 billion by 2020. This is a projection uh, based on past practice and, and modeling to 2020. Uh, $65 billion to implement and about $2 trillion of benefits. And so the benefit cost ratio of the Clean Air Act relative to sulfur and nitrogen was 30 to 1. So it paid back hands down to society. And the same thing happens with carbon. A lot of it just comes from the co-benefits. You limit carbon, you limit other pollutants, and the human health uh, the, the positive human health impact pays back to society big time. So I would go very cautiously on arguing that mm, we need to do it, but it's a net cost. I think it's a net benefit if we stand back far enough and look at all aspects of the issue, said the soil scientist. Um, as far as costs, uh, you know, what, do we, what gets our attention? And uh, a decade ago, if I, someone said, what about we have a year where well, this, this, this happens. What do you think would happen? Oh, man, you know, we would just be all over this issue. Well, we all know we had 2017, and in 2017, uh, we spent in the U.S. $306 billion, according to a NOAA study, on the $16 billion or more uh, disasters having to do with all of the hurricanes, fires, floods, um, and, of course, uh, that plot in the middle is the rising CO2. And so... That's easy to identify. There's a clear cost to us uh, of these kinds of uh, acute disaster events. Full stop. Um, and, and we pay for these. That's not where I spend most of my time thinking about. I think that animates people enough. I think uh, uh, more about uh, the cost of adaptation which is, uh, you know, sort of very granular in, in scope. We're going to hear about 
people th thinking about and acting and doing things that have to do with adaptation. It's, you know, lots of little uh, activities that we do, but we do them now in a different way because we incorporate the changing climate signal as part of our decision making. Um, you know, I'm going to be really happy when no one asked me to give a talk on climate change because thinking about climate and incorporating it is so mainstreamed that it's not a topic anymore. We're, we're not there yet, and so we're still at the point of trying to understand how do we incorporate it and trying to develop the information and tools that are needed. Um, before I wrap up, uh, there, I, I use this as an example of one way to, to think about it. And so there are these companies called Munich Re and Swiss Re. Uh, and these are the reinsurance companies. Didn't know anything about them until I sort of got into the climate change world. But they're the companies that insure the insurance companies. Um, and so these companies have been doing an outstanding job of evaluating climate change with major climate change initiatives for decades, no matter who is in Geneva or the White House. Um, and this is kind of the granular aspects of an analysis that I find so compelling. It's simple, and so I also understand it. And what these are showing is a couple of case studies for specific activities. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter that you can't read them. What you can see is there's lots of lines, and there's lots of different adaptation practices that they put a price on each one of them. This is the one, uh, or it's the one line for them. Uh, if the practice cost is below that line, then it's cost effective. It's going to pay back for you to do that. If the, it's way above the line, don't do it. Uh, might sound good, but it's going to cost more unless you want to and, and, and want to uh, make that investment, of course. But from an economic standpoint, don't do it. And then the insurance companies get really busy right in here when they're uh, insuring the risk just over the line. This kind of detail, it's a lot of work, it takes a lot of expertise like the folks here today, um, but we're seeing it all the time and we're seeing more and more of it. And this is kind of where I think the rubber meets the road relative to uh, smart adaptation using climate information as part of everything else you're doing, not as a, a separate category. So let me finish up by uh, regarding climate change in Maine. Uh, take home messages, it's real. There's no question uh, that it's changing at rates that are faster than we have seen in the recent past and anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases are part of it. Uh, it shapes our lives and economies. You know, um, the, if, if you mow your lawn earlier in the spring, you're adapting to climate change. Um, but obviously a lot bigger things than that. Uh, we're not helpless at all. Lots of things that we can do on both sides of the mitigation adaptation. Uh, but business as usual is not an option. We'll never have the 20th century again, uh, the climate of the 20th century again. Uh, and so I, I think these kinds of discussions are really great because they move us to uh, thinking about and, and implementing uh, how we can do this smarter uh, in the reality of the 21st century. So with that, um, um, if there's any quick questions, but we're going to move to the panel. I'm the moderator, so this is the awkward part where I say, you have any questions? and then I'm going to cut you off. But uh, if there's any quick question right now, uh, I take it. Go ahead. So it's getting wetter, but it's dry as heck and has been last year, too. I know that's weather versus climate, but just tell me what to say to people about how dry it is. Yep. So um, it, it, it's, it's weather versus climate, but it's climate when it happens year after year. And so um, we've gotten warming both in the spring and the fall, but the fall has warmed up a lot. Um, the precipitation doesn't tend to be more in late summer, uh, but the temperature does, and so your moisture deficit, you drive it out of the ground, you create droughty conditions. Um, so we're having more extremes, we're having more variability. Exactly what they said we would have, and that's what we're experiencing. And so yeah, for us, uh, and I talk a lot about it, as a soil scientist, I'm really interested in some of the impacts of that moisture stress that now is more common as compared to in the past, despite the fact that they were fighting with too much water just two months ago. So um, that is part of the syndrome that we're in. Okay, any other quick questions? All right, so uh, thank you, and I'm going to move on to the uh, panel section now. Um, we're going to have a series of speakers. Is the next slide going to come up after that? Oh, okay. Um, let me introduce uh, our next speaker, and, and then at the end of it, we'll all come up to the table for a, 
uh, we have plenty of time for, for Q&A, which uh, will be great. So our next speaker is Cy Balch, uh, Certified Forester, Forest Care Management and Education. Uh, Cy is a certified forester with the Society of American Foresters and a licensed forester in Maine. Uh, he's working with Manimet on their Climate Smart Landowner Network Program and is a board member representing New York and New England for the Society of American Foresters. Uh, Cy has extensive experience as a forester traveling overseas to study forest management uh, in Europe and Asia uh, and as chief forester and silviculturist for Boise Cascade, Mead, and Mead West Vaco. And so with that, Cy. So, functioning in a warmer world, um, I am speaking basically on work done by the Climate Smart Land Network, which I will explain. Not quite sure why it's cut off at the bottom, but that's all right. Um, so, the network basically it was put together by Manomet about five years ago with the idea of trying to affect as many forested acres across North America as possible. Um, to get those owners, primarily industry, to begin to think about the fact that things were changing. So we are acting as an extension service for them. All of these people realize that something ought to be done, but they are busy, very busy, as Ivan said. So we are reading the science and we are helping them understanding, understand it and implement adaptation. So we are doing direct extension work and interpreting science for this audience. We are uh, at about 33 million acres now across North America from Nova, Nova Scotia to um, including Ontario uh, to Washington State where we are providing them with information. We provide them with bulletins. Uh, we ask them to talk to us. We answer questions. Um, they share information amongst themselves if they can do that without violating antitrust laws. Um, for those who work in nonprofits, antitrust doesn't mean much, but if you're for profit, it means a great deal. So, Maine, um, these are eight members, members that are of the network that are in Maine and they are caring for about over three million acres here in the state. So this is direct to the state of Maine. Um, Acadia uh, is the former Fraser lands, Baskahegan is 100,000 acres uh, in Washington County. J.D. Irving uh, is both Maine and uh, Maritimes, land vest manages land up around on the northwest border. Maine Woodlot Owners Association is based here. Um, New England Forestry Foundation, I were used to work for them, so they were low-hanging fruit. They were sort of a, a test market to begin with. Um, Wagner uh, manages a lot of land, and Weyerhaeuser is the latest member to join this. They are the largest landowner in the United States with 13 million acres themselves, of which a chunk is in Maine because they recently took over um, what had been Scott and was uh, moved on to um, Weyerhaeuser now. Trees didn't exist, we would try to invent them. Uh, <laughs> they turn dangerous CO2 into a, so into, into a solid that we can build things with. I mean, what could be better than that, all right? <laughs> it's, they're amazing. Um, and Maine is the most heavily forested state in the nation. We're at 90% trees. People come here from other parts of the world and they basically um, if you're from the southwest, you feel claustrophobic because there are trees all over the place. Um, forests also provide clean water, air, and spiritual solace. They, are, they do all of these things for us that we would wish would happen if they weren't already there. Um, World Society doesn't seem willing to basically control CO2 at the time. There's a lot of talk, not a lot of action. So we have to adapt. Humans are very good at adapting. We are a very successful interglacial species. In the last 10,000 years, we have boomed. We were around before then. We were hanging on before then, but the last 10,000 years, wahoo. Um, and this is going to be very wrenching. We've done a lot of adaptation before. We're going to have to do it again, and it's going to hurt. Ivan has already showed this. This is global temperature. Um, this is a really important slide. Where's all that heat going? We're getting warmer and warmer and warmer. Most of it's going into the ocean. And the ocean is a huge flywheel. 
and it is warming up. It takes a lot of energy to warm up water, and it stays there for a long time. So this isn't a quick fix. We could fix air, all the emissions day after tomorrow, and we would be dealing with this for at least the next hundred years and probably several hundred years because of all the warmth we've poured into the ocean already. Um, this is a temperature chart, very similar. It shows two things. It shows that as you go sort of further north, if we went down to the tropics, it would, it would be less dramatic. As you go more toward the poles, it's more dramatic. Um, it also shows some of the variability across the country. It's interesting because we work with folks in the south as well. You go talk with foresters in the south and say, have you seen anything change? And they say, no, they're right. Because there's this tongue of cold air coming down the Mississippi Valley recently. Um, we've also discovered that if you talk with practitioners, you say, have you seen anything changing in relation to climate? No. Have you seen anything changing in relation to the operations that you're carrying out on the ground? Yes. What are you doing about it? We're doing the following things. So you don't have to break somebody's arm and make them say climate change. You want to have a conversation, talk about what's important to them. This is the other thing I haven't touched on. This is extreme precipitation. We are getting deluges that we have not seen before and will continue to see. And that's a pretty major change. You know, a four inch rainstorm used to be really unusual. It's not unusual anymore. Um, I did want to mention, I haven't held a book. He had a picture of one. I'm holding up a, a physical book. This is the synopsis of the last four years worth of work by Manament in a single book. Um, I have three copies with me. If you are really interested in forests and want to take one home and promise to read it, take it home. It is also available online, um, but this is a wonderful book that talks about all of the aspects that we've been through and the advice we've been giving people. Let's see. Okay. The things we anticipate here, shorter, warmer, wetter winters, and this goes back to the question of when we're getting the precipitation. The projections that we see and what we think we're seeing on the ground is that it's more in the winter than the summer. So we're getting wetter winters, drier springs, drier summers, which is somewhat paradoxical, but that seems to be what we're seeing. Um, longer, warmer, drier springs and summers, and I should add falls to that. Um, more deluges and a few extreme events that can bring sudden ecosystem change. So the ecosystem normally changes fairly slowly. George Jacobson and others, you look at this, you know, what's the forest going to look like tomorrow? Well, about the same as it does today. Next year, about the same. Um, but if you get um, an extreme event, high, what I call a high energy event, and that can be um, uh, an insect event. Spruce budworm is certainly a high energy event. Um, you can have windstorms. Uh, thankfully, we are, there's not much wood here, but I guess the thumb. Very lucky on fires so far. I mean, we're in a state where the last big fire year was 1947, right? We have to get really excited about fires in 1947. What a lucky situation to be in. The next fire year after that was 1977. We burned a total of 5,000 acres. We had two in, in sort of Major says we had two fires, each of 2,500 acres, and it was this huge event in the state of Maine. I mean, in California, you know, it's an afternoon cookout. It's just <laughs> <laughs> so very different scale. But those changes can bring a can big effect because then then essentially the ground is bare and is open to change that wouldn't have been had the forest been evolving more slowly. Um, so this was uh, the climate changes. This are some of the biological results. We are going to see a northward shift of insects uh, and plant diseases, uh, which we are already seeing. I mean, there's southern pine beetle in Connecticut now, OK? Um, and insects. Um, we have some that we worry about, like emerald ash borer. That's not climate driven. That's not a climate related discussion. Uh, they are adapted to northern stuff. They started in the Upper Lake States in the UP. So the fact that they're here now is not a climate-related thing. Um, uh, on the other hand, hemlock woolly adelgid is to some extent a climate-related thing. Southern pine beetle is very definitely climate-related. Um, we are seeing some rusts and fungal diseases on foliage in particular that seem to be climate-related. 
uh, birds and other wildlife, you know, we have new birds, wahoo, you know, we have things we never saw before and it's exciting at your bird feeder. We tend to notice arrivals more than departures, the thing you suddenly haven't seen for five years, you kind of don't remember that, but you remember the new ones. Uh, we have possums, how many people in the state have seen a possum? Right, we never had possums before, um, but we do now. <laughs> uh, and plants, we have, we have plants that are coming north, some of that's wonderful, it's fun and exciting to have new things. Uh, we might have tulip poplar in the not too distant future. We are gonna see more deer browsing. I get fairly excited about deer when I go to Connecticut and New Jersey and have very knowledgeable botanists come to me and say, this is a dead end forest. You will never regenerate it because the trees are eating everything. You're done. Standing trees are what you've got, you won't get another tree. That's pretty depressing. That's too many deer. So just be aware our deer population in some parts of the state is increasing pretty dramatically. Um, we are going to see some increased growth. It's warmer, there's more CO2, um, a longer growing season, plants tend to respond to those things. So we are likely to see increased growth, which has already been recorded. Um, uh, not a lot, but some. Um, we are going to see some heat and drought stress. So those dry summers that are on droughty sites, if you have a tree species that's sensitive to water uh, on the downside, you're going to see individual trees begin to domino out. We had, a, we had a drought, oh, probably in the 80s, and I worked out in western Maine at that point. And if you drove west along the Androscoggin Valley into New Hampshire, it goes through the um, fairly steep valley, and there were these rock outcrops. And oak is a, very adapted to dry conditions. But it was dry enough that there were oak trees dying on those outcrops. So you drive along, and you see this little brown spot on one of those outcrops where that oak tree finally gave up the ghost. Um, we will have novel species. Uh, our concept of ecosystems where all these trees, forest types, all these trees are together. My analogy is it's as if you get to a bus stop. Seven people are standing in the bus stop. You think there's something going on between them. There isn't. They all got there on different buses. They're all leaving on different buses. They just happen to be standing there when you got there. That's what's happened. That, that is our forest types. These species travel around individually and will continue to travel around individually. There's very little interdependence between tree species or plant species. Um, one of our biggest worries is tripping over thresholds. Uh, this is known as unknown unknowns. And they're almost impossible to identify before you trip over them. You go, oh, oh, that was, oh, that was one. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of research going on. I have a, a fun little example here. For instance, less snow means that soils and roots are more exposed to freezing temperatures due to the lack of snow. So the ground is bare and it freezes, the roots are frozen. If there's a foot of snow on there and it freezes, it's warm underneath the snow. It's warm enough that the fruits off, roots often do not freeze. Um, what effect will this have on soils, roots, and microbial activity? There's research going on at Hubbard Brook. There's research I talked to somebody just a couple weeks. I think there are 16 different uh, experiments going on around the country by different things, you know, burying electric cables and having huge electric bills to warm up the soil to figure out what goes on and that sort of thing. And, and it's very interesting. But that's the, that's the sort of thing that's going on. So these are the components of profitability, and those of you that are in business know this. Consistency, that leads to predictability, that leads to efficiency, that leads to profitability. If you're working in a system that is inconsistent, we already work in a natural system, subject to weather, subject to biological changes and all that. So foresters and loggers are pretty darn good at dealing with the uncertainty side, but this is adding a whole nother layer of uncertainty. Um, therefore, less predictability, therefore less efficiency, therefore less pr profitability. And the trick is to try to basically reduce those things. So I've got a couple of pages of adaptations. The first one is look after yourself. Um, if you go to the, uh, the US Forest Service climate hubs, which are doing very nice work, different work than we're doing, not in conflict. I'm amazed at the, at the, the confluence of suggestions and adaptations and responses to the various things that are going on. 
there are a dozen outfits across the country working, and they're all, there's a huge overlap in, in suggestions that they're making, which is very nice. Um, so look after yourself, number one. Um, you put in bigger culverts and bridges to deal with the downpours. That's the one thing that, um, the first thing that foresters and operations people talk about is washed out culverts and bridges. If the culvert washes out, don't put the same size culvert back in again. <laughs> um, one of the companies dealt with this was very interesting. They used to judge their foresters. They had a budget. Every forester had a budget for a certain amount of roads on the property. And so when they were putting in culverts and all that, their costs got, it was one of the things they were measured by, and bigger culverts cost more money. So there was a disincentive to put in bigger culverts. That company started in the spring, and they bought truckloads of culverts and put them in a central location and said, if you need a culvert, just go get a culvert that you need. You're no longer going to be judged by the size you put in. There you go. Very simple. Um, better machine access trails and roads. This gives you access so that if something goes wrong, you can go fix it or you can go manage it. It's much easier to have a system in place than to have to build two miles of road to get there. Um, uh, better fire readiness. Even though fire is relatively un, uh, low here in the Northeast, if you are ready, it's better. So you put fire tanks in every truck. You, you know, it's fascinating. Irving is one of these members. Privately owned company, so they have different economics, but been in their land, big extensive ownerships. They literally have fire trucks parked through the, through the woods in the summertime. At road intersections, there is a fully loaded tanker sitting there. And they have little hoods over every tire so they don't deteriorate in the ultraviolet lights. Um, they have that, for years they've had their own Air Force, where they've got six or seven of these uh, AGCAT planes sitting on a runway in the middle of Black Spruce, ready to go. If something catches fire, they're ready. Um, but just being more ready. More active invasive plant control, it's kind of like fires. Invasives are like a slow, a slow fire. If you can get them when they're little, it's great, you can put them out. Um, it involves pesticide licensing, it involves pesticide availability uh, to people walking the woods, but if you find one barberry in the middle of the woods, it's very easy to deal with. If you wait till it's six feet tall and fills the woods, it's a whole different story. Um, thinning trees uh, to improve growth, reduce water stress, and improve wind firmness. This is a very, very interesting. This costs some money. It works better in young stands. It's almost impossible to thin an old conifer stand. You can thin an older hardwood stand. If you thin an old conifer stand, conifers tend to grow up and hold each other up. They grow on the buddy system. And when the wind blows, they lean over, and there's a buddy next there to hold them up. Well, if the buddy next to them is gone and the wind blows, down they go. And so they don't, they tend to be a lot less wind firm. But if you start with trees that are 15 to 20 feet tall, you can really develop some very interesting forests going forward that, that are much more resilient to the changes coming. And grow a variety of age classes and species. Um, because we don't know how different species are going to respond. And the time that trees have to express any adaptation they have is when they reproduce. So give trees a chance to reproduce and express that change that they are trying to express to adapt to the things that they have going, see going on. Page two. Uh, genetics research. There's some really interesting, we work with folks in the south. In, they're in a plantation system. And you say, well, things are going to change. And they'll go, well, we're on a 20-year rotation from planting to harvest, full rotation 20 years. And they're harvesting trees that are this big at 20 years. And they have seed orchards. And they have research cooperatives. And they'll say, well, if things are changing, you know, we've got a bunch of trees right over there that is better adapted to the climate that's coming. And we're just going to plant those instead. What a wonderful answer. <laughs> They've really thought that through. Um, and also, they, they didn't do it in anticipation of climate change. They did it in anticipation of variability and wanted to know how different seed sources uh, did. How am I doing? OK. Um, so Irving, I keep going back to Irving. They, they are doing serious genetic research, and, and they plant a bunch of trees. And they're continuing to. They are, um, they are doing this somatic embryogenesis, which is fascinating, uh, where they're taking ones that they've developed, and they can, they can slice them and clone them and grow seedlings and plant exact replicas of that because they know it's going to work. 
There's also this interesting field called epigenetics. The word has come up in the last several years. It applies to people, applies to all organisms. But it basically says there's more gene plasticity than we realize. It's not a matter that the genes themselves change, it's that when different parts of them are expressed. Um, and this is recognized in plants for sure. The, the best example I have is there was somebody that took a Scots pine from northern England, which is basically southern Norway, um, adapted to those conditions, and planted it in southern England, quite a long distance. That tree, when it matured, began to throw seed that was adapted to southern England. Nothing changed genetically. It was the same tree. It just it responded. So there is more plasticity and more adaptability in some of these, in all of us, including us, than we really recognize. It's a very interesting field to study. Um, monitoring forests uh, for measurements, permanent plots. Go out and say what's there now and then track that over time. We are developing um, what's called the RAF, which is not the Royal Air Force. Um, uh, let's see, something about resource, I can't remember the acronym. Anyway, we are helping our members develop um, try to key points to try to go and measure in the forest to, to track changes. New remote sensing, uh, uh, infrared, satellite photography, LIDAR is coming up. Uh, lots of different remote sensing things are coming up to really help with this monitoring, but that's a very important part. Uh, bu <coughs> buying crop insurance. It turns out that you can buy crop insurance for your trees. I didn't know that until I started in this process. There's an outfit out of South Carolina that sells it. Probably will be more. It's literally Lloyd's of London. You take your piece. I, I said, what does it cost? They said, tell us what we're insuring. I said, what does it cost? They said, tell us what you're insuring. So I sent them my 50 acres. They want to know where it was, GPS location, approximate value of the standing timber, and I sent it to them, and they came back to me and said, we will insure 80% uh, of your standing value. I think it was $5,000 a year on 50 acres. They assessed where it was, the damage. You know, I didn't have a fire danger, but I did have a wind danger. And they literally sat around and said, okay, who wants to insure this one? <laughs> but it's out there. Um, so you can modify your equipment and work hours. Uh, you have to get in and get out as fast as possible. You know, in farming, they say cut, you know, cut, cut hay or make hay while the sun shines. In forestry, it's cut wood when the ground's hard. And that's either winter or summer. Ground's hard, um, but it's changing. So you'll be able to get in when it's good and get out when it's not good. Um, and the carbon market comes and goes and may come back again, and that is a really interesting, it's a brand new forest product that never existed before. It's just like every other forest product. It's just a new one uh, with a lot of lawyers and regulators involved in it and financial people, um, but it's a really interesting market that exists and will mature over time. The Chinese are beginning to get into it. That's going to be a game changer. The only one in the US now is California in a serious way. That's the so-called regulatory market. There is a voluntary market um, where the price is less, uh, but Volkswagen decides it wants to brush up its image, it buys voluntary. The airline industry is fascinating. Worldwide travel, the airline industry is really getting very interested and concerned about their impact on global climate and what they can do about it. And so I expect them to be entering the carbon market in a much bigger way. Uh, it is expensive. It's not for the 50-acre woodlot. Uh, you get money up front, but then you spend most of that money monitoring it over time. There's a very serious monitoring part that goes forward that costs considerable money. OK, so you protect yourself. I know you all do this, but you put on uh, repellents, uh, DEET is wonderful. Beyond 50% DEET isn't worth it. You don't pay for more DEET. Um, uh, tuck in your socks. Uh, check yourself every day. Um, wear light-colored clothing. If you have a mate, get them to check you over. I used to hire interns. Um, and the first day of work, I handed them each two hand mirrors. And I said, with two hand mirrors, you can see everywhere. So. <laughs> Uh, and if you're in the woods, tell your, or if you're out in the woods a lot, tell your doctor what you're doing. The, the, the medical community in Maine has now really changed, and they, they very quickly uh, get to this discussion about whether it's Lyme disease. Five years ago, not so much. Today, I've had doctors tell me if in a, if in a 
if an adult comes in in the summertime with a fever, the first diagnosis is, is now Lyme disease. Um, Culverson Bridges, Maine Audubon has a, has a very nice online um, uh, thing for that, uh, training for that. USGS has a very nice online tool called StreamStats. Uh, if you're interested in building culverts and bridges, it's a very nice GIS tool. It will calculate the watershed, give you the flow, all kinds of things very quickly. Um, this is something I developed. This is, this is this interesting concept in, in wind firmness and, and thinning. It's called the height diameter ratio. It basically says if you measure the diameter of a tree uh, and you convert it to feet, so everything's in the same unit, um, and compare it to the height of the tree, you get a ratio. Very simple ratio. You divide one into the other. <laughs> um, and so you have in the green and the sort of khaki colored are probably, are definitely more wind firm than what's in the red. And you go into a lot of spruce stands, you get a six inch tree and it's 35 feet tall. The ratio is 80 or 90 or 100. Um, the tree that grows in the middle of your lawn that got blown out all the time is somewhere about a 20. You know, it's short, it's bushy, you could never sell it if you ever tried. You're hitting, you're trying to hit that middle line. Um, so this chart actually works pretty well. Be nimble and informed. Uh, Dr. Nacy, who is Director General of the Center for International Forest Research at a 2018 conference, just happened uh, in May. We are very unlikely to achieve the one and a half or even two percent degree limit and we are much more likely we will end up at a three degree warmer world and that's three degrees centigrade not three degrees Fahrenheit so it's more. <laughs> we are headed there. We are very likely to be there so we better get ready to be there. Um, so who will be the winners? First, nobody's going to be a winner. <laughs> but then, second, those who invest now in mitigating and adapt tech, adapting to those changes, they're going to be the winners. I'm, I love the displays in the back. This is, we've got to go there, we've got to go there more. But from an economic standpoint, gambling on the fact that it's going to be even warmer than we think we're going to be, and those that figure out how to make money at that, and there will be serious money to be made, um, are going to be the winners. That's it. Thank you, Cy. Um, introduce our next uh, speaker. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, Aaron Roche, uh, Crop Insurance Education Program Manager. I guess I never knew that was your formal title. Um, Aaron works at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension as the Program Manager of Maine Crop Insurance Education Program. The pro program exists in partnership with the USDA Risk Management Agency to provide crop insurance education and risk management resources to Maine farmers. Aaron's also the new coordinator of the Maine Climate and Agriculture Network, uh, a group initiated by UMaine faculty and cooperative extension staff to increase communication and coordination among these working on those working on issues related to climate change in agriculture. Uh, Aaron's got degrees in plant, soil, and environmental science uh, uh, from the University of Maine and uh, from forestry from the University of Vermont. So it's a pleasure to introduce Aaron. Okay, great, great to be here. Thanks to E2 Tech for hosting this event, and it's great to see such a strong um, interest in this topic. Um, and also great to hear crop insurance come up so many times uh, earlier today. Um, so that's awesome. So in, in my role at Extension, um, as Ivan mentioned, I do crop insurance education for farmers. Um, I tell them about the federally backed crop insurance options available to them. Um, so my position is really interesting because I get to hear firsthand from farmers about um, their weather risks and their plan for managing those risks. So we'll talk a little bit more about um, what I'm actually hearing on the ground from farmers about weather. Um, the other group I'm involved with at the University of Maine is the Maine Climate and Ag Network. This is a group of UMaine um, extension folks with faculty and um, students. And our common interest is that we're all doing research and outreach um, related to climate change and agriculture. And so um, while the purpose of our group is to increase communication um, both within, within UMaine about this topic, um, we also um, like to bring some of this information out to the public. And so um, 
one of the most recent activities our group did was uh, this past winter at the Maine Ag Trade Show. Um, we hosted, we co-hosted a, um, a session called Farming in a New Weather Reality. And we uh, recruited five farmers from um, these different ag sectors in Maine. Um, and, and the purpose of this session really was to shine a light on what farmers, um, what changes they've experienced um, over their tenure of farming and, and how, how have these changes impacted their farm and what have they done to adapt. Um, so all of the farmers um, except for one were full-time farmers and they had at least 20 years of experience farming. So all totaled they had almost 165 years of farm experience combined. Um, and so uh, we learned a lot from this session, um, and some of the, um, I'm going to summarize some of the perceived weather changes um, that came up during this session, and how, what farm, how farmers explained um, that these impacted their operations. And so, um, one of the most common um, changes that farmers brought up during this session was that they were noticing an increase in heavy precipitation events, um, the types of events that Ivan mentioned um, earlier, where we get two inches of rain within 24 hours. So four of the farmers mentioned that um, this was a change that they've experienced on their farm. And the types of impacts that this change has caused um, was an increase in soil erosion. Um, Heavy precipitation also limited their um, field access or entry because you can't enter a, a field with a tractor um, when soils are super wet. Um, and one farmer talked about how um, heavy precipitation was causing some poor crop establishment for him. The next um, kind of theme that we heard throughout this session was that farmers were have noticed that the growing season length has um, been extended, and that mild that winters were becoming um, more mild. And so um, the perceived impacts of this uh, was that they felt that this opened the door to some new pests and parasites on the farm. Um, a few farmers talked about increased incidence um, and contraction of Lyme disease among farmers as potentially being a um, perceived impact. Um, and our orchardist uh, noticed that, you know, back in the day she used to have very cold winters, a negative 40 degrees where um, the trees would literally um, blow up in the orchard due to these cold temperatures, and she hasn't seen that in years. So that's one potential um, benefit of a change. We heard farmers talk about um, cooler, wetter springs that we're having now, um, and this obviously affects soil nitrogen mineralization. So um, nitrogen is less um, able to mineralize when uh, soil temperatures are wet and cool. Um, our sheep breeder um, said that uh, during lambing season, um, cooler, wetter springs were causing more stressful conditions for her sheep, um, and thus was resulting in some lamb death. Um, and she also noted that uh, with wet springs, it's hard to get out on the fields and uh, spread manure um, during the springtime season. Lastly, a couple of farmers noticed an increased incidence in drought. Um, and uh, interestingly, our turf farmer um, said that, you know, while he was experiencing drought conditions on her, his farm, his customers were also coming to him with a demand for more drought tolerant grasses. So here we see it's not just what the farmers are experiencing, but um, there's a market demand component to this as well. Um, and then farmers talked about seeing um, reductions in pasture regrowth as a result of drought. So um, we heard a lot of you know, important themes, and I think they kind of echo what um, Ivan laid out um, as far as what was listed in the main um, climate futures uh, handbook. Um, the next element to this conversation was we, we asked farmers to tell us what adaptation strategies they've put forth to kind of deal with these changes. And so I'll just share a couple of the specific stories from a few of the farmers we spoke with. So this is our turf farmer. Um, he talked about seeing these rainfall extremes on both sides of um, the coin. So periods of drought and then periods of these really intense rainfall events that were causing some soil erosion and limiting access to his fields. And so his way of responding 
to this change um, was to look at what species he's planting and variety selection. So he, um, he uh, incorporated more uh, drought tolerant grasses into his mixes now and um, also he was getting that demand from his customers to also um, have those types of sods and then he was also he also um, began growing grasses that have a really quick uh, establishment so when there is that heavy rainfall period he has some um, biomass there to uh, prevent erosion um, he made some capital investments to deal with this, um, with this change. And this was a common theme um, we heard from many of the farmers. Um, so this farmer um, increased his capacity to irrigate all of his fields. Um, and he also increased his capacity or his window to get out on the fields and harvest when conditions were wet. The next farmer uh, we heard from was a mixed uh, veggie grower, and um, the heavy rains were also an issue for him, and this was causing some erosion <clears throat> and limited his field access. He also is growing on really heavy, uh, slow to drain soil, so this kind of magnified his issue. Um, and his response to dealing with this issue was to create a permanent raised bed system. So in effect, he was limiting um, compaction within the tire track area um, to stay in that area. Um, so he was able to um, shed more water um, through that method, and that required him buying a new, new um, implement to do so. And then he also adjusted his bed orientation to have a slight slope so that, that he was able to shed some of that water. Um, so, you know, overall, this was a really great event. I think we, as ag service providers, we, we learned a lot. Um, the one big thing being it's really hard for farmers to tell one linear story about a change that they've experienced, how it's impacted their farm, and how they've responded, because everything on a farm is so interconnected, and every farm is so unique when it comes to soils and the farmer's beliefs and their markets, et cetera. Um, so anyway, the Climate and Ag Network looks forward to doing more of these types of events down the road. Um, so the, the question was posed for this event, you know, what, what impacts will climate change have on Maine's ag economy? And I think this is a really um, tough question. It's very obviously interconnected with a lot of factors. Um, and we're not necessarily there yet in terms of a dollars and cents number. But one thing we do know is that in terms of agriculture, climate change will definitely bring opportunities as well as risks. And um, the better off farmers are prepared with some uh, response actions to some of these risks and the better that are they are they can capitalize on some of these opportunities um, probably the better you know the outlook will be um, so one um, effort the climate and ag network put forward kind of to address this issue of potential response actions is this um, one page fact sheet and I, I brought some if folks are interested in looking at it but it kind of breaks down um, what changes we've seen in terms of temperature and precipitation and what changes we're expecting to see and it offers up some potential response actions farmers um, could take to address those things. So for example, the longer uh, growing season obviously brings some opportunities in terms of per perhaps growing longer season varieties or double cropping or incorporating things like cover cropping onto the farm. Um, whereas things like we're seeing these early spring warm ups, but then um, we still are in that window of uh, frost freeze risk, which is a problem for a lot of our fruit trees. Um, when it comes to that risk, you know, farmers have to be thinking about increasing their emergency response capacity through things like um, uh, wind machines, uh, frost protecting through frost protectants through irrigation, um, stuff like that. Um, and also, I'd like to just give a nod to some of the research that's going on at UMaine and at Extension um, around this topic of climate change and ag. Um, so. We're, we have you know, specialists trying to drill down into some of these um, specific questions. So um, we have an extension specialist looking at doing some, or she is doing some modeling to assess climate adaptation strategies in potato grain rotations. So she's looking at you know, what are the effects of um, having good soil organic matter and using irrigation um, in our um, potato grain rotations in light of um, long-term climate predictions. 
We're also doing some research looking at the potential weed invasions um, that could be coming to Maine. And then um, one uh, really useful tool that is currently available to farmers right now is called Ag Radar, and this was developed by our IPM specialist um, at Cooperative Extension. Um, and this is a tool that incorporates weather data with pest and disease um, cycles, and so it, it essentially helps farmers um, determine when the most effective time to apply um, sprays or other control methods. So. There are a lot of, um, there is a lot of information out there and I think that pool is growing. So thank you for your time and I um, look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Aaron. So we'll roll along here to our next speaker, Ben Martins. Uh, Ben's the executive director of the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association, <coughs> a fisherman-led nonprofit that identifies and fosters ways to restore the fisheries of the Gulf of Maine and sustain Maine's iconic fishing communities for future generations. Uh, ben was hired as executive director in 2011. It's helped build MCFA into a progressive voice for marine stewardship and community preservation. Uh, ben has extensive experience in environmental and uh, marine policy, project development and coordination, meeting facilitation, and nonprofit management. Before joining the Maine Coast Fishermen's, uh, Associa uh, Fishermen's Association, uh, Ben was a policy analyst for the Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance, working on projects fo focused on state water fishery policy, ecosystem restoration, and federal fisheries management. Uh, while working at Cape Cod, Ben served as proxy for Representative Sarah Peake on the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, uh, the regional body that develops and implements regulations for all state uh, waters uh, along the Atlantic coast. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ben. Nice to see you. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys for having me. I'm really excited. Uh, so I am not a climate expert. Uh, as you can hear from my background, I'm a policy person. Uh, and so today we're going to be talking a little bit about fisheries, the Gulf of Maine, policies, uh, and our working waterfronts. Uh, most of what I'm going to be talking about is commercial fisheries out on the water where they're actually catching the fish. Uh, I am not an expert in aquaculture, but I do have a liberal arts degree, so I can pretend to be one. And uh, so if we have questions, we can talk about that later. So uh, as, as you heard, uh, the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association was started 11 years ago by fishermen who felt that they need to organize themselves to create a voice for Maine's community-based fishermen. Uh, things were changing out on the water, and regulations were kind of undermining their attempts to rebuild the Gulf of Maine ecosystem, uh, and they were disenfranchising Maine's small Maine boats. So these fishermen came together because they felt as though they needed to create a voice, make that voice heard, and then try and impact the changes for the benefit of this and future generations of fishermen in Maine. And so they created this organization, uh, and it was to identify and foster ways to restore the fisheries of the Gulf of Maine and sustain Maine's historic fishing communities for future generations. <laughs> and we're a pretty unique organization because we put the fish first. Uh, without a healthy Gulf of Maine resource, we don't have viable fishing businesses. Uh, we don't have vibrant fishing communities. So really what we're trying to do is fight to ensure that we're working to rebuild the Gulf of Maine ecosystem, which leads to more fish, which leads to better businesses, which makes sure that we can continue to have these fantastic working waterfronts and coastal communities throughout our state. And we do that by uh, kind of binning our work in these, these four boxes. And so we try and uh, create management and policies that have the benefits that we see that are important for the Gulf of Maine and our small uh, boats and working waterfront communities. Uh, we try and come up with innovative solutions to solve fish the issues that fishermen are facing. Uh, we protect uh, and create access for fishermen, both in permits and on working waterfronts. Uh, and then we do stuff like this to try to raise awareness about our work and the issues that fishermen are seeing out on the water. So uh, that's a little bit about where I'm coming from, and you need to understand that while I try and be as unbiased as possible, I've got a perception, uh, I've got a work to do, and so um, that just gives you an idea of where our association kind of sits in the big scheme of things in the Gulf of Maine. So now let's talk about the Gulf of Maine and what's happening out there. First, I need you to understand that this is really complicated, right? 
Ecosystems are complicated. We heard a little bit about our forested landscape. Um, now we're moving in three dimensions. And in the Gulf of Maine and in our ocean ecosystems, everything eats everything else. You can't just say, we've got a tiger and the tiger's gonna go over there and eat this little baboon or something. Uh, a big fish will eat a small fish. It doesn't care what species it is. Uh, so we've had some issues where a forage species like herring might be declining and the result isn't that we have less big fish in the ocean, it's actually that we'll have a spike in big fish because the herring were eating the babies. So there's all these unintended results that don't always line up linearly as we're thinking through these processes. So um, that's just to continue to stress, like there's a lot of uncertainty in fishery science uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty in the ocean. We know more about the surface of the moon than we knew about, know about the bottom of the ocean and how our, the ocean ecosystem works. And in fishery science, everything you look at has huge error bars around it. We don't know what's going on out in the ocean, and we uh, don't really have great tools to figure it out right now. And then on top of that, we've been catching a lot of fish for a long time. Uh, we actually had some of our first fish stocks collapse in the Gulf of Maine in the late 1800s, where we fished down the halibut resource. That was just with little dinghies and uh, hook and line. So we've had a lot of impact for a long time out on this Gulf of Maine. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, we've been putting a lot of bad stuff in the ocean for a really long time. The ocean was our dump. So um, everything that we wash away, everything that we flush away, everything we clean up ends up floating downstream and ends up in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and that's plastic, medicine, uh, synthetic hormones, every type of industrial waste you can imagine. All of those things are going in the Gulf of Maine. So um, I'm putting this all in perspective because what we um, need to understand is climate change is happening, but it's happening to an ecosystem that is not pristine. It is a rebuilding ecosystem and it is currently under a lot of stress and there's more stress coming with rising ocean temperatures and ocean acidification. So, the Gulf of Maine. Most people don't actually know what that looks like. Uh, this is the shaded area here is what's considered the Gulf of Maine. That also encompasses George's Bank. And it's one of the most unique uh, marine environments in the world, not only because um, of what's happening here with the Gulf Stream uh, and the Labrador Current. The Labrador is bringing cold water down that's nutrient rich, and the Gulf Stream, stream is bringing warm water up. Uh, and those two things kind of drive a really unique current system in the Gulf of Maine that creates one of the most um, robust and uh, one of the, one of the uh, basically we create a lot of fish out there, right? It is one of the most productive ecosystems in the world. And we've been taking hundreds of millions of pounds of fish out of there for hundreds of years and there's still fish. It's amazing. Uh, and we just need to understand that a little bit. And then when you go closer in, um, you can start to understand why the Gulf of Maine is uh, increasing in temperature faster than 99% of the global ocean. Um, the lighter areas here are shallower areas and darker is deeper. Uh, the Gulf of Maine is a bathtub and the water goes in there, it doesn't come out very easily, it sits there, um, and as some of these climates, uh, climates warm, as the currents shift and move, um, we're, we're seeing that, that water temperature uh, go up very quickly. And as it goes up, the fish that have tails move. Uh, and the other species that are in the Gulf of Maine, like scallops and whatnot, um, a lot of them, they settle based upon that when they spawn, their, their little babies go into the water column and those move. They get caught in currents, they move around and they find um, areas where they can settle. And so there's pretty fast shifts in our ecosystem when it comes to fish stocks. And we've already started to see that. Um, this is uh, a chart for the northeast in, from the Pinsky Lab down at Rutgers, and this is showing a change in latitude based on where they catch fish stocks um, throughout New England and mid-Atlantic waters, and um, the change in latitude has slowly been increasing. Uh, if we were also to include depth here, um, the depth has also been increasing in where they're catching fish, although uh, a recent study came out this week that suggested that might be because it's easier to catch fish in shallower waters. 
um, and it, not, it might not be a driver in, uh, due to the temperature. So that's where it also starts to get, get complicated. Uh, and then closer to home, we've also seen a shift, and I apologize, this is uh, a little bit washed out, but uh, the Island Institute published this fantastic resource called Waypoints this year, um, or last year, I suppose. And uh, this was one of the charts in there, and I stole it from them. And uh, you can see the pinker uh, kind of blob down here. This is lobster. This is where lobster was caught. The pink blob is the 1970s, and that's where the majority of lobster catch was. And uh, while you might not be able to see the colors, you can start to see the, the numbers uh, of the years, 1995 and 2015. Uh, and if you were to be able to see this, there's a blue shade and a green shade. And the majority of lobster catch has moved into the Gulf of Maine. And we've actually seen a collapse of the lobster fishery uh, in southern New England. And that's been great for us. Uh, in the mid-90s, early 90s, um, we had a fairly diverse fishery in the Gulf of Maine, uh, in, in the state of Maine, for what we were landing. We landed about $100 million worth of fish in our state, and about 123 million, or 37 million pounds of 123 was lobster. So really nice little pie chart there uh, that shows we had a diverse uh, uh, fishery and landings in our state. Now we do not. Uh, we land a lot more value in our state of marine resources, but it's almost all lobster. And as I showed you previously, lobster obviously is impacted by climate change, uh, warming waters. It's already moved uh, pretty significantly from south of Cape Cod to the north. Uh, we're already seeing fishermen throughout the state of Maine having to chase lobster further offshore, uh, work harder. So um, this has been a, a nice boom, but after every boom, there starts to come a bust. And um, this is just a different way to show some of those numbers. There's uh, two lines on the, or there's three lines on this chart. We've got the red line, which is lobster landings and millions of pounds. Uh, we've got the ground fish landing, which is blue. We're going to ignore the green line, which is urchin, because uh, nobody cares about urchin. But uh, the ground fish stocks, as you can see, they declined in the early 90s and the lobster fishery took off. Um, you can point to a lot of different reasons why those things happen. Ground fish like to eat baby lobsters, so it might have been that we fished down all the predators. Um, we also might have been creating a much nicer environment in the uh, Gulf of Maine for lobsters to exist in. We also put lots of traps in the water filled with bait that lobsters can go in and out of, so we could essentially be ranching lobsters out in the Gulf of Maine. So there's a lot of factors that go into this. Um, but uh, you know, the real takeaway I want you to see when we look at this is things change when it comes to our landings and our current lobster-based economy has not always been and it will not always be. And those shifts have had really profound impacts on our working waterfronts. Um, we've started to make a lot of money on lobsters, but on the downside, a lot of our infrastructure is decaying that does not directly impact lobster. So the ground fish fishery, uh, that's where a lot of my work has been focused. Portland's shutting down its working waterfront. Um, the other day I was meeting with a developer who's trying to sell one of the piers down there. And we we're talking about the need for uh, access for the working waterfront in Portland for commercial fishermen. He said, what are you talking about? The fishing industry is dying or dead. There's no future there. We need hotels. We need high-end condos. That's the future of Portland. That's what people have decided. Part of it's because of climate change. And we hear over and over again that the warming Gulf of Maine means there's not going to be any fish anymore. Um, so we need to be concerned about how we talk about climate change at the same time. So that kind of hits on that doom and gloom. Um, you know, climate change is a real issue, uh, but we're starting to write off the fishing fleet because of it. And then fishermen are starting to write off policy changes in response to climate change, right? Why should I hurt my business right now if the fish stocks are going to collapse in the future because of something I cannot control, right? Why should you limit my business if the warming water means there's not gonna be a future here? We saw that happen in the southern New England area with lobsters, and they won that argument. They basically collapsed that fishery and they allowed that fishery to collapse over time because they said it's not gonna ever come back. And we are making that argument right now as a state, 
on trying to allow a shrimp fishery in the Gulf of Maine that has collapsed and we haven't seen in five years. And our state is arguing, let's just let the guys go out and catch whatever is out there because it's never coming back. So climate change is something we need to be aware of. But it's also a tool that can be used to undermine conservation. So um, after going through all that, I, we need to kind of take things in a little positive route. Um, <laughs> So, but first we need to talk about uncertainty. And as I mentioned at the start, fisheries, scientists has, fisheries science has huge error bars. There's lots of uncertainty in science. And um, right now, there's increasing uncertainty because of raising water temperatures, ocean acidification, and we need to figure those things out. But that also means that we don't know what opportunities might be coming as well. Um, we did have that ecosystem in crisis, so we don't know what a robust and vibrant ecosystem with climate change would look like versus our current ecosystem. Um, so that kind of starts to give us this opportunity to talk about things in the future a little bit differently. It's not all going to be downhill if we're rebuilding at the same time. Um, and we talked about pollution and some of the other issues that are going on. The big thing I want to hit on with this, though, is correlation is not causation. And um, we need to talk about things differently when it comes to climate change and fish stocks. So I'm going to use a, an example of something that the Gulf of Maine Research Institute published. I love the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. They are fantastic. But they came out with a paper that showed that the Gulf of Maine cod species was collapsing because of rising up water temperatures. And the idea was we have now have a consistent, bar gra or a consistent line graph showing that rising ocean temperatures are going up. So anything that is going down at that same time is because of warming waters. Could be. We don't know. There's lots of other things that impact cod. They want bait. They want to forage. They want, there's fishing pressure on them all the time. Um, and so we need to make sure that we understand all the different pieces of what the fishing industry looks like and the fishery science looks like before we start jumping to conclusions about what the actual drivers are when it comes to what's causing declines in fish stocks. Climate change is definitely a piece of that equation, but there's a lot of other things to go in it. We were catching way too many cod at the same time, right? We were taking too many out of the water, and fishermen were saying that. Uh, and then to come up and say, nope, it's because of climate change, now you're removing people from having ownership of part of the problem. And so, opportunities. This is U.S. meat consumption uh, from a couple years ago. We eat a lot of beef, we eat a lot of chicken, we eat a lot of pork. We don't eat a lot of fish. We eat about 15 pounds of fish every year um, per person, and most of that fish is really bad. It's tuna and shrimp. And 90% of it comes from overseas. So we are making a lot of really bad decisions about what we're eating when it comes to seafood. Uh, if you were going to talk to your doctor and say, what do I need to do to be healthy? He would say, don't smoke, wear sunscreen, and eat seafood. That's what you need to do. We don't eat seafood. Um, but what's really, really interesting is now we also are still getting lots of data that point to eating seafood is really, really good for the environment. Um, the uh, Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment just came out with a research paper this past week uh, that pointed to having a seafood diet as being exceptionally good to reduce your carbon footprint and environmental impact. Um, and a lot of that was focused on uh, shellfish and mollusk, uh, but it also included capture fisheries like cod and pollock and hake, the ground fish that we catch in New England, as being particularly important to be eating, and that those things can start to have a positive impact on your carbon footprint. If you replace beef with fish, that can have more of a significant impact than switching from a Hummer to a Prius. So, as we're looking at what we're talking about here, right, a plant, a, a, a diet that has, has fisheries in it and a lot of fish and shellfish is actually better for the environment than vegan diets, right? Because if you start eating shellfish, those are taking carbon out of the water and, and taking that carbon and putting it into shells that then exist for a long time. It's, it's a great way for it to do carbon sequestration. So 
Um, this is where that opportunity starts to come through and something that we need to be thinking about as a state. Um, we talk about climate change and fixing climate change with whether it's offshore wind, uh, whether it's reducing our carbon footprint through changing our energy sources, all these other things. The best thing that we can do is eat more seafood and find ways to make sure that there is a robust seafood industry in our state, that there's a lot of fish in the ocean, that we are supporting aquaculture in our state, um, and try and make sure that we're replacing our bad meats with good meats. Over the next 50 years, there's going to be a growing population throughout the world that is demanding high quality protein sources, and we can be a source for that. We can be a place that is creating a high quality protein source that is also low in carbon impact. So uh, that's what I had to say today. Thank you very much, and I'll uh, turn it back to you for the next presentation. Um, next speaker is, where'd Pete go? Oh, there you go. Uh, Pete Slavinsky, with the marine, he's a marine geologist with the Maine Geologic Survey, um, yeah, with degrees in, from Franklin Marshall College and the University of South Carolina. Uh, uh, Pete's an expert in coastal vulnerability assessment and resilience and adaptation planning. Uh, Pete helps communities to visualize coastal hazards, develop viable local and regional adaptation strategies, and make technical science understandable to a variety of different stakeholder groups. When he's not in the office, he's either in the field or chasing surf, snow, or fish. With that, turn it over to Pete. All right, so um, we're going to stay in the marine environment. Uh, and talk a little bit about one of the measurable um, factors of climate change, which is sea level rise. And of course, I'm going to be focusing on sea level rise and coastal flooding, and those are compounded by precipitation and the precipitation changes that we're seeing. I'm not going to really get into that, but I'm going to focus a little bit on what is causing some of the sea level changes that we're observing on a global scale, on a local scale, and then we'll finish talking about some of the adaptation that Maine municipalities are actually undertaking right now. So there are basically two dominant factors that are causing the changes that we're seeing in global sea levels. The first, about 50%, these percentages change a little bit, is attributed to volumetric increase. So literally increasing the volume of our oceans due to input from land-based ice sheets, um, like Antarctica and Greenland, and glaciers. Okay, So melting of those is combining about 50%. About 40% is due to thermal expansion. You've already heard about the warming of our water column. Literally, as the water column warms, it expands. And about 10% is due to a variety of other factors that include gravitational changes associated with Antarctica and Greenland, um, changes in ocean circulation, which I'll touch on, land movement, and then actual terrestrial storage of water. So if we look at Antarctica and Greenland, they're both losing mass. That's all you're supposed to take home from these two images. So, of course, the volume of the ocean is increasing due to melting of Antarctica, Greenland, and also our glaciers. This is a study of about 30 um, glaciers. Their thickness is actually decreasing. All of that is increasing our water levels. Combined with that is the concept of thermal expansion. And the upper chart is showing that the upper car couple hundred meters of the ocean are trapping immense quantities of heat. And as a result of that, there's impacts to fisheries, but also there's expansion of the water column. So as a result of all these things together, we're seeing on a global scale, sea level is rising at a rate of about 1.8 millimeters per year. It doesn't sound like much, but I'll put that in context for you. Now, over the last 20 years, roughly, using satellite data, um, the rate of sea level change has actually increased to about 3.1 millimeters per year. So not quite a doubling, but a significant increase in the rate of sea level rise. So what this graph is showing is satellite data going, um, this is actually measured satellite data from around the world, and the combined influence of both volumetric increase and impact from thermal expansion. So this is thermal expansion, this is volumetric increase. When you combine these two, it actually matches very well the trends that we're seeing. So that's on a global scale. On a local scale, because we want to actually see what's happening in Maine, there's a tide gauge of annualized sea levels from Portland, Maine. Now, there's a lot of variability in the data, but the key is that blue line that's going up. It's a rate of about, and it's starting to forward on its own, um, about 1.8 millimeters, 1.9 millimeters per year. Same exact thing that we've been seeing on a global scale. 2017, 
is right there. And on the shorter term, roughly the last 20 years, we've also seen an uptick that's matching the global oceans at a rate of about 3.1 millimeters per year. Now, everybody thinks sea level is this thing that's slowly happening over time. It's something we don't have to worry about 2050, 2100. I want you to take a note of that. What is going on? Um, I think it's set to automatically forward my slides somehow. So we'll battle that through this presentation. But this is 2010, so sea level can actually change abruptly as well. And there are a couple of different factors, and Ben mentioned the Gulf Stream, that actually come into play in terms of quickly, on a monthly basis, changing our sea levels. So back in 2010, on average, in the Gulf of Maine, sea levels were about five to six inches higher than normal. That was, high, that was, was a whole East Coast phenomenon, but it was five to six inches higher than normal uh, in, in the Gulf of Maine, and especially in Portland, okay? It was the highest along the entire East Coast. That was caused by two factors that happened on a very, very short time scale. One was the slowdown of the Gulf Stream. So the Gulf Stream actually props up water in what's called the Sea of Sargasso here. So what happens is when the Gulf Stream actually slows down, the water that's propped up in the Sea of Sargasso can slosh against the East Coast of the United States. And that's exactly what happened. Okay? So sea levels are not equal around the world. They're very, very, very different if you looked at topography of the ocean surface. So that's one factor. Second factor is something called the North Atlantic Oscillation. It's the way pressure systems set up over Greenland and the Azores. So that you have a, a low pressure that sits offshore and the jet stream dips south. You remember 2010 was a very snowy, cold year, and they were complaining about the polar plunge, whatever it's called, where cold air comes down, but it also steers nor'easters right up our coastline. Okay? You combine those two things, you have elevated sea levels. Six inches, six inches doesn't sound like much. I'll put it into context for you shortly. In 2010, five of our highest sea levels that we saw on a monthly basis since 1912 occurred. As a result, this is a, Higgins, this is a spot, there's a photo from Higgins Beach. Here it goes again. <laughs> this is a photo from Higgins Beach. Um, that's a 3,000 year old marsh surface that's exposed. I talked to folks that live there that um, they've been, been there for 60 years, they'd never seen it before exposed, okay? We also think similar conditions happened in the past winter of 2018 when we had four back to back to back to back nor'easters um, and also elevated sea levels. So where might things go in the future? This is a chart from NOAA, a study that was published in January of 2017 um, showing tide gauge data, satellite data for the last 20 years, and then a scenarios that are tied to those global climate models that Ivan showed in the first couple slides. This scenario of one foot is basically what happened over the last 100 years is exactly what's going to happen over the next 100 years. Almost impossible because we've already trapped so much heat in the oceans. This lowest scenario only takes into account thermal expansion, doesn't even touch input from Antarctica or Greenland, which as we saw is 50% or more of the input. When you start looking at scenarios of 3.3 to 5 feet, that's starting to balance things out with thermal expansion volumetric increase and the high scenario to extreme scenario take into account almost catastrophic melting of uh, Antarctica and Greenland. Not, you know, catastrophic, catastrophic where we lose everything but on the high end of things with a very low probability. So this is globally. Unfortunately for New England, um, because of certain factors like the Gulf Stream and like the fact that we are heavily influenced by what happens in Greenland, our lower scenarios are about the same if, we're, if, we're, if we have these. But as soon as you start getting to these higher scenarios, we start seeing a larger deviation uh, up to about potentially 11 feet by the year 2100. So looking at an intermediate or an intermediate high scenario, somewhere between one and a half and two feet by the year 2050, I think that actually, actually jives with numbers that Ivan uh, put, and then out by 2100, somewhere between three and about six feet in those intermediate scenarios. All right. Sea level is not the only thing we have to worry about, though. It's the storms that hit us when sea levels are elevated that cause problems. So storm surge. You all hear this thrown about all the time. Storm surge is simply the difference between a predicted tide and what's called the storm tide. The storm tide is what comes in when a storm makes landfall. And the difference between those two, the prediction and the observed water level, is what we call storm surge. Okay, so in this example, there's a 10-foot predicted tide. 
a measured storm tide at a tide gauge is 14 feet. There's four feet of storm surge. One of our largest surges we've had was about 4.8 feet, but luckily it hit a low tide. Okay, just to put that in perspective. Now, this is from Superstorm Sandy back in 2012 at the Battery in New York. To give you an idea of what this looks like, this is the predicted tide in blue. When the storm made landfall, this is the observed storm tide in green, okay? That reached, what, 11.3 feet. The difference between those two is nine feet. They had nine feet of surge during this event, and it married with exactly high tide. They have a very low tidal range here. We have a very large tidal range in Maine. That actually benefits us because we have to have conditions marry up perfectly for us to have a maximum storm surge hit at a maximum tide. But if our water levels are elevated constantly a little bit because of sea level rise, that's going to have a larger impact. So having tons of free time on my hands, I um, said, you know what, what about storm tides if we went back historically and looked at all the data we have over roughly 100 years? What, what are the recurrence intervals and the percent chance? So you hear this 100-year storm, 100-year recurrence interval being thrown out all the time. All that means is it has a 1% chance of occurring in any given year. That's why you can have back-to-back 100-year -back storms. So a one-year recurrence interval means that there's a 100% chance that that's going to happen in a given year. We get tides of 12 feet in Portland every year. 10-year, think Patriot's Day storm of 2007. It's about 13 feet. 100-year event, statistically, is about 13.7 feet. Our highest event was January 7th, or January, February 1978 um, of 14.1 feet. That actually exceeded this statistic number. But what do you notice here in terms of these numbers? They're not that far off from each other. There's only a one-foot difference between what's called our 10-year event and our 100-year event. So if we have one foot of sea level rise, we could see the impacts of a 100-year event at a 10-year recurrence interval. Another graph, um, just to kind of give you, the, so it, what we're looking at here, the top 25 highest annual water levels, annual water levels, so that's the highest water level for a given year, okay, so far. Um, the tidal component is in blue, and the surge component is in red. You're not looking at gigantic surges here. Again, we're lucky that we have this huge tidal range. This is our historic event. This is from January of uh, 2018. You remember winter storm Grayson? Tons of coastal flooding. It's the second highest water level if you're looking at annualized water levels since 1912, okay? It's the third if you're looking at different, different kinds of water levels. So, so January and February of 1978 were higher than that. Um, but anyway, that's just to put it into context. So here's Patriot's Day storm. And there's the perfect storm of, two, of 1991 all the way back here, if you remember the book from that. That had a very large surge. All right, so how might sea level rise impact what we call nuisance flooding? This is uh, right near Whole Foods in Portland. Um, this is uh, from October 2016. This is a beautiful day. This is just a high tide. This is a king tide event where the water reaches a certain point. So the flood stage is about 12 feet, okay? So when water hits 12 feet, you're going to see this happen in Portland. If it rains six inches on top of that in three hours, that makes things a lot worse. So what I did is I looked at historically how many times from 1912 to 2017 have we hit flood stage, uh, which was 12 feet. And on average, it's about 10 times per year historically, about 1.3% of high tides. With one foot of sea level rise, the flood stage goes down to 11 feet. If you Look just historically at our data, not even looking forward with changing conditions. That would jump to 98 times per year. So 100, 100 times per year we'd see flooding. So a tenfold increase with just one foot of sea level rise in terms of this nuisance flooding that we're seeing. And that's common for cities up and down the East Coast. It's not just for Portland. So in summary, in terms of some of the science, we'll get onto the adaptation stuff in a second. Short term, probably somewhere between one and two feet by 2050. If we're looking at intermediate to intermediate high scenarios, somewhere between three and six feet by 2100, but the potential for there to be a lot more. So when we're talking about critical infrastructure, if you're citing something that's gonna be there for 100, 200 years, you probably wanna err on the side of being conservative from an engineering standpoint, not saying, oh, it's only gonna be half a foot of sea level rise. Sea level 
rise increases both the frequency and duration of annual tidal events and storm-driven events. Sea level rise is not necessarily just something that we have to worry about in the long term, in slow rise. It can have these abrupt changes. And Maine has been very lucky because we do have a large tidal variation, um, which, again, we have to have perfect conditions marrying to have a surge really hitting at a high tide. All right. Talking about some of the work that we've been doing, we work with a number of communities uh, up and down the coast of Maine, 40 communities over the last 10 years about sea level rise and storm surge. And one of the things before we get into what the communities are doing is I want to preface some of the challenges. We're a home rule state. So we've got a state level of government, a very weak county level of government, government except for maybe some EMAs. Um, and then every community is kind of doing their own thing and responsible for themselves. So that lends itself to one community saying, well, you know what, I find sea level rise really interesting. Well, the next one might say, you know what, I want to, doing something with our municipal ball field is a lot more interesting than thinking about sea level rise. There's also been a general lack of financial and political support um, from the state level to pursue climate change and sea level rise. Um, what we, we have done a lot with what we've got, and I think that's very good. Um, there are some grant programs that communities can use to pursue adaptation. Um, so, but work has really been solely based on individual level interest from communities. Again, the result of that is we create what's I'm, what I'm calling a patchwork of resiliency, where just in one little stretch of coastline, you could have one community doing all the right things while their neighbors are doing absolutely nothing. When we're talking about adaptation, what does that actually result in? So much of our work has actually been focused on what I call low-hanging fruit. So pursuing adaptation that's relatively simple, relatively low cost, that is transferable to other communities. So what I'm going to do now is just share with you a couple of case studies um, that look at these low-hanging fruit adaptation strategies. One is revising or developing ordinance or plan language, and what we're going to talk about is SACO. Uh, but Dan Riscotti, York, Bodenham, and South Portland have done these things in terms of comprehensive plan changes and also flood and ordinance changes. Adapting waterfront infrastructure, I'll talk about that. Adapting critical infrastructure, like wastewater treatment plants. And then elevating critical roads. All things that are transferable for other communities. So this is an example of a home on the Saco Old Orchard Beach border. Um, base flood elevation is roughly this red line you see down here. And what, what the community of Saco implemented is a change to their floodplain ordinance. Every coastal community has a floodplain ordinance that requires that new construction or construction that is rehabbed more than 50% or if it's damaged more than 50% and rebuilt has to meet a minimum floodplain standard. And the standard for the state is one foot above base flood elevation. So that red line down here is that one foot above base flood elevation or base flood, base flood elevation. What they decided to go to is three feet above base flood elevation. This home is construct, constructed so that it's three feet above that line. This home actually is a little bit higher because somebody miscalculated and used a different datum. But that's okay, they went higher. So they were safe. So we're talking about economics in all this. How does that play into economics? Well, actually it makes a lot of sense. You've probably heard of flood insurance if you live in a flood zone. Um, in Maine, the average A zone policy, so an A zone is just a static flood zone, no waves hitting you or anything like that, is 1,500 bucks a year if you have no freeboard. If you meet the state floodplain requirements, which is one foot, you have a 50% savings. Two feet, 63% savings. If you go up three feet, you're saving almost 70% on your flood insurance, okay? Which over the lifetime of a mortgage is about 30 grand. And if you are in a V zone, which is an active, area with waves greater than three feet, you could save about 150 grand on a 30 year savings. So there's a big financial incentive in addition to being more resilient. So we've also worked a lot with communities, and this is kind of tough to see, but um, with the community of Damascata, um, one of our coastal community grants was issued to the community and we're technical advisors on it and a consultant was hired, Milano Room Engineers, and they did an analysis of this historic downtown. If you've ever driven down to Damascata, go to the Pumpkin Festival, whatever, this parking lot is full. This parking lot also floods a lot. 
these, home, these businesses are all now in the new flood zone. So what the community wanted to do is look at different ways of ba basically adapting their downtown. So all of the infrastructure, it's hard to see, but all the infrastructure in here, the, ele the key elevations were surveyed in. So how low is the door opening? How low are the window openings in relation to the floodplain? And then it was looked at on a structure-by-structure -structure basis as to what kind of improvements would need to be made to make the infrastructure more resilient. The community decided, you know what, we're not going to depend on every individual business owner doing the right thing to become more resilient. So they're pursuing the construction of a, a new seawall. There's actually a seawall here now. But they're going to be looking at the construction of an elevated wall, which allows for protection of the entire parking lot and therefore the protection of these structures. Similarly, um, there was a study that we just concluded in Booth Bay Harbor looking at their, work, at their waterfront infrastructure. Same kind of methodology, looking at specific infrastructure, in this case the fish pier, looking at key elevations throughout the fish pier, and then coming up with, okay, here's your risks, and then, oh, by the way, here are potential costs to fix those risks and what they might cost in five years, 15 years, and 30 years, okay? To give businesses the information they need to make the right decisions as it relates to being more resilient. We would be nowhere without our critical infrastructure. Some of the most critical infrastructure are our wastewater treatment plants and our pump stations. This pump station is from Old Orchard Beach. Um, in the Patriot State storm of 2007, there was four feet of water here. Uh, the, the electricity you see here got underwater, got blown out. This thing was ruined, basically. So what they did is they went in and built a backup generator that's protected by a wall and also elevated the utilities inside this and also the electrical panels, okay? So simple things, protecting existing facilities. The other thing is we've done studies in Booth Bay Harbor and Wiscasset um, and also uh, Agonquit looking about how do you adapt existing wastewater treatment plants for the future. And some of that relates to different standards that are now being in, in, passed by what's called, oh boy, the New England Interstate Wastewater Pollution Control Commission, maybe? <laughs> um, which said, if you're building new wastewater treatment plants, you are going to elevate everything to base flood elevation plus three feet. So the studies we have done looked at these, this infrastructure and said, OK, well, what about sea level rise on top of that? So we were looking at BFE plus four, plus five, and plus six feet in thinking about making these more resilient. And then the last kind of low-hanging fruit, but also costs a lot of money, is elevating roads. Kennebunkport was having a huge problem. This is Dyke Road that comes into Goose Rocks Beach in Kennebunkport. This is King's Highway. They were having a huge problem with this flooding out just during high tides. So they said, you know what? We're going to elevate stuff. This was on their own volition. They went and elevated this entire stretch of King's Highway. Um, and then a section of Dyke Road, 1,000 feet total. It's going to be hard, hard to see, but maybe you'll see. This is 2012 after they finished the project. They elevated this whole thing to protect this from flooding. It's a simple, relatively low cost improvement, and it's going to buy them some time. All right, I want to finish by sharing with you a couple um, of mapping and uh, informational uh, Available information for communities to use to help drive some decision making. One is a storm surge mapper um, that we've created. It's very simple. It just takes high tide and then adds different sea level rise scenarios to it. You can zoom around the whole state and see what might get wet under what scenario. We've also, this is, gets a little scary. We didn't talk about this, but this is hurricane inundation for a category one through four hurricane. We've created these maps for the whole state. Um, you can do the same thing there. And then uh, just recently, we published what's called the Main Flood Resilience Checklist. And it's a checklist that allows for a community to go in and kind of self-assess itself to see how resilient they are, or to see how prepared they are for different coastal flooding events. Uh, with that, um, thanks. So um, our last speaker in the lineup um, is Rachel Bouvier, founder and principal of 
Um, Arbuvia Consulting. I, I hope I'm doing all right with the last name. Okay, so far so good. Um, Rachel's founder and principal uh, <coughs> of the company, a woman-owned economic consulting firm specializing in environmental and natural resource economics, climate change, and community economic development. She works with businesses, government agencies, and nonprofits to help integrate environmental risks and benefits into economic decisions. Prior to founding the, the company, she was associate professor of economics uh, with tenure and adjunct associate professor of environmental science and policy at the University of Southern Maine from 2005 to uh, 2014. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, she has taught about environmental economics and community economic development at Wellesley, Mount Holyoke, and Colby Colleges, as well as at the University of Southern Maine at the University of New Hampshire. Rachel earned her PhD in economics from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and her master's degree in resource economics and community development from the University of New Hampshire. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rachel. All right, good morning, everybody. Hey, I got a response, excellent, thank you. Um, so I took some notes during the presentation, thank you, Melissa. And I'm um, going to take advantage of my august position as the last speaker to kind of do a little wrap up of some of the things that we've already heard and also uh, to fill in some of the gaps. So let's see if I can do this the right way. Okay, great. So what we've heard so far, we've heard from uh, several industries that will be directly affected by uh, climate change. We've heard about forestry and fishing and agriculture, uh, as well as from Pete about the impacts to, uh, to coastal, uh, coastal municipalities. I've seen uh, some of Pete's presentation before, um, and I was really hoping he has this great slide of uh, showing the uh, flooding around Whole Foods in Portland, and there's also the Loch Ness Monster in there. Uh, so I was hoping that that would, uh, that that would come out, but um, unfortunately, no. So that's too bad. Um, but, uh, so uh, I'm going to zoom out a little bit uh, to look at things from maybe a more uh, statewide pers uh, perspective because, yes, we want to look at the effects of climate change on each particular industry, but also to get, to get an idea of kind of the larger picture. Um, these natural resource-based industries that we've heard from are actually a very small part of Maine's overall economy measured by, uh, measured by employment, although they're very important from a cultural and, uh, and a historic perspective. So if you see on the right, if you rank the, uh, the industries in Maine by employment, you'll see that the top three sectors are uh, healthcare and social services, retail trade and accommodation and food services, and uh, agricultural, forestry, and fishing comes in at in, uh, at 17, uh, which is uh, out of 21. So from an employment perspective, uh, these, uh, these industries, although incredibly important, again, from a cultural and historic perspective, um, only uh, make up a small percentage of employment in Maine. So we want to take a look at some of the other industries that are going to be affected as well. On the left-hand side, and I apologize if you, uh, you really can't see that graph. Um, but uh, this graph, the one on the left, talks about, um, uh, how should I put it? They talk about, it talks about traded clusters. And what a cluster is in economics is it's a grouping of a particular industry. Um, and so on the left-hand side, we talk about clusters in Maine by employment that deal with, uh, with products that are traded outside our, our local economy. So there are local clusters and there are traded clusters. And so on the left-hand side, and you'll be able to see this graph more clearly, uh, Melissa, this will be up on our website, on your website, so um, you'll be able to see this graph more clearly. There's a really cool tool called um, uh, cluster mapping, um, which goes into some of the performance drivers, some of the economic performance drivers of, of different regions. Um, and so you can see that, um, or you can't see, but you could see, um, that, uh, that the fishing and forestry and, uh, and actually sh uh, shipping industries are here, uh, are, they have outsized importance from a kind of an uh, bringing money in from outside. So from an economic development perspective, these, uh, these industries are very important. 
But I want to point that out um, because you might say, okay, well, I don't work in the agriculture, forestry, or fishing industry, and I don't live on the coast, so why should I care from an economic perspective? Um, and so what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about, okay, well, let's take the, th the top three industries from employment in Maine, um, and let's talk about some of the economic impacts to those. Um, and so, uh, again, the top industry in Maine from an employment perspective um, is the healthcare and social services industry. And so I wanted to focus on some of the things that are likely to happen or likely to affect the healthcare industry in Maine. Um, and some of these uh, some of these effects are already uh, already taking place, right? We're going to see, or we have seen, as uh, as a number of people have talked about before, um, increase in prevalence of Lyme disease and other vector-borne diseases in Maine. Um, we're going to see an increase uh, in the prevalence of waterborne diseases. And part of that, um, and I want to uh, want to talk a little bit about this because it's something that uh, that I've done a lot of work on recently. Um, with these large, with these increases in uh, high volume precipitation events, so we're talking rainstorms where you know three to six inches of rain fall in a very short period of time. Um, your, uh, your municipal wastewater inf infrastructure may get overwhelmed and combined sewer overflows may send a large amount of untreated sewage into, uh, into our waters. So this is a real problem. Uh, you know, in Portland, for example, there are uh, combined sewer overflows that are ringing uh, back cove. Um, and despite heroic efforts by the city to, uh, you know, to, to uh, separate the stormwater and wastewater systems, a lot of that still remains. Part of the issue there is when we, when we release untreated sewage into the water, uh, it can have obviously health effects for people and individuals, or for people and for other types of critters that swim in that water. And so um, we can see an increase in waterborne diseases from that, but also uh, red tide outbreaks, for example, that can have a devastating effect on, uh, on shellfish beds in Maine. Okay, so these are some of the things that uh, that we might see or uh, or are starting to see in the healthcare sector. Um, we're seeing uh, uh, extreme temperatures, right? And so uh, when we talk about heat waves, our infrastructure, uh, our housing stock in uh, in Maine is not really set up for 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 heat waves, right? And I see this myself. I just moved to Maine. Um, I hesitate to say it, but I moved from Massachusetts. Don't hate me. Um, I got here as soon as I could. Um, uh, so you know, we uh, we brought a uh, we moved here in 2005. We brought an air conditioner with us. It sat in our attic for a while because you're like, well, we had a couple days of really hot weather. It's not worth bringing the damn thing down from the attic and putting it in. And now it's like, okay, we need to we're going to need to start using that a little bit more, you know? So it's just within that, that period of time. But the point that I'm trying to make here, right, is that a lot of our housing stock, it's, 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 uh, we're, we don't have a lot of air conditioning uh, in Maine. We haven't historically needed it. And also hesitate to say this, we're getting older. Um, we, we're an um, aging population, and along with that aging population comes more vulnerability to, uh, to, uh, you know, to these sor sort of extreme temperatures. So we have extreme temperatures combined with vulnerable populations. That is not good news for our, uh, for our healthcare industry. Um, and also, one of the things that we might not necessarily think about is uh, an increase in, re in uh, asthma and other uh, respiratory ailments. Okay, so we're talking. Um, there's a uh, there's a correlation between uh, between obviously uh, heat and humidity, uh, and the amount of uh, pollution that you have on um, in the ground level atmosphere. Right. Um, so you'll see increased numbers of uh, of heat related um, warnings. Right. Um, and we're also going to see uh, uh, seasonal allergies, okay? Ragweed, 
loves global climate change. Awesome, right? Because it grows better. Ragweed grows better in higher temperatures and with higher CO2 concentrations, right? Um, as well as, uh, as poison ivy, my particular uh, bane. Um, I just look at it and I get a rash. It's terrible. All right, excuse me, water. Okay, so there's, you know, so we're going to see an increased stress on our healthcare industry from these particular, uh, from these particular things. Um, the uh, kind of the, one of the other industries that, uh, that we wanna look at is uh, tourism and recreation, right? Um, and this one, you know, there, there are, you know, there are many different um, parts of the tourism and recreation uh, industry. Um, but the three really that I wanted to focus on here are uh, beach going, recreational fishing, and uh, bird and animal watching. And um, on the right hand part of these uh, right hand column on this table, we talked about the, uh, the factors that are sensitive to, again, I'm an economist, so uh, what we call uh, factor, factors sensitive to uh, climate change and their likely effect on demand or supply. Of, uh, of that particular service. So if you look at beach going, right, we, we expect that, uh, that the number of beach goers will increase due to uh, temperature and sunshine, right? But we're also get, seeing these negative effects or we could potentially see negative effects from higher precipitation and from beach erosion. Right, we're in Maine. We're pretty lucky because a lot of our coastline is rocky. A lot of our coastline is is protected from erosion. Um, but if you look at places like, um, help me out, Pete, Cape Cape Ellis, is it or Camp Ellis? Yeah, that's right. They are. Um, they they're having some serious problems from uh, from beach erosion, and so we're we're finding this uh, we're finding this as well. Um, Recreational fishing, right? Again, positively related to uh, temperature and sunshine, negative from um, uh, water pollution from urban runoff, but also species availability, right? Okay, so you think about what our recreational fishing industry is, uh, is made up of. It's generally made up of uh, cold water habitat, freshwater fishing, right? Um, those types of habitat, at least from a thermal habitat perspective, um, well, we're going to see those types of habitats declining uh, in, uh, in Maine, and that's going to have a, a, a detrimental or could have a detrimental effect on our recreational fishing industry. Um, and then finally, bird and animal watching. There's, this is kind of a kind of a mix because people like to go out to do, you know, except for my uncle who will go out in all sorts of uh, all sorts of weather to see a bird. Um, birders are crazy. They're crazy. Anyway, okay. So you know, a lot of people, normal people, would like to go out on nice weather to see uh, birds and animals and that sort of thing. And so positively related again to temperature and uh, sunshine, but uh, precipitation not so much. Um, and then you know, again, as uh, as Sai was saying, right? We're we're seeing new birds and that's all exciting but we're also seeing uh you know different sorts of species and, and so it's kind of a wash to say okay well what's that you know what's that gonna end up uh, end up looking like in the future okay um other industries that uh that we didn't really uh didn't really touch on too much um uh real estate right um, it's interesting because uh, I have a, um, you know, some my friends knew that I was uh, going to be doing this, and so as soon as the Union of Concerned Scientists came out with a uh, came out with a little uh, tool talking about the impact of climate change on uh, coastal properties, I immediately got three emails from three different people, Pete included, um, saying, "Hey, have you seen this?" And so, yes. I have. Um, and so, uh, so if you take a look at the Union of Concerned Scientists website, they have a really cool tool where you can go around and you can look at the impact of, of sea level rise on, uh, on coastal properties. Um, but this isn't just a coastal issue, right? And that's one of the things that I feel like I really, really need to highlight. Um, living in uh, inland areas uh, uh, can be and will be affected as well, right? 
Um, not just if you live by a river that's, uh, that's subject to flooding, but um, because of some of these high precipitation events, right, the water comes in but has nowhere to go, right? And so we're seeing an increase in, uh, in urban flooding, um, and we're seeing also an increase in, uh, uh, you know, Cy mentioned uh, culverts, right? Um, culverts are getting washed out because of these high precipitation events. Um, and yes, culverts are, uh, larger culverts can be more expensive to, uh, to, to put in, but over the lifetime of the culvert, and I did some work with the Nature Conservancy on this a couple of years ago, um, uh, over the lifetime of the culvert, once you include in uh, maintenance cost and, uh, and the risk of failure, those larger culverts can be, uh, can be substantially, uh, they can be less expensive or they can be uh, cost, they certainly can be cost effective. Um, but from, uh, from a real estate perspective, right, I'm, I'm going to be working with, uh, with a group in, uh, in South Carolina um, where they are facing a lot of repetitive losses from, uh, from flooding. Um, and so FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, will foot some of the bill after a flooding disaster, but they won't, you know, they, they're not going to cover all of it. Um, and so this particular municipality has been, uh, has been helping out proper, uh, property owners. Now they're thinking, okay, well, we're going to have to buy up some of this property. You know, we're, we're just going to have to write it off. Okay, and so we're seeing, we're seeing more, and more, of, uh, more and more of that. Um, and so the insurance industry, speaking of that, right, can also be, um, uh, you know, as they continue to foot the bill, right, this is going to be, uh, become unsustainable. And so a lot of uh, smaller, certainly smaller insurance companies may actually uh, become insolvent. This is the gloom and doom section. All right, so shipping. Uh, actually, shipping is, is good news, right? Arctic Circle, excellent. Northwest Passage, let's go. All right, sorry. Okay, um, but uh, increase in uh, weather instability could lead to, uh, to shipping disruptions, and that is a bad thing. But on the other hand, the Northwest pas Passage through the Arctic Circle is becoming increasingly more navigable. Um, which will uh, reduce uh, reduce shipping costs, um, and uh, that is a uh, that is an opportunity that uh, um, that Angus King, for example, is very uh, very interested in pursuing. And so here we have you know we have a dilemma where, let's see, where was I? Um, a while ago, a couple of years ago, my husband and I went to uh, Cornwall, England. And um, there was, we went to a pub, and in the pub there was a little sign that said, please don't let there be any shipwrecks, but if there are, let them happen here. You know, because the people would go out, and if there was a shipwreck, they would all go out and they would loot the shipwreck. And that's kind of like the idea of climate change and shipping. Please don't let things be too bad, but if the Arctic, if the Northwest Passage is navigable, Let's go. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's um, it's kind of a kind of a wash there. Um, and uh, Pete also talked on uh, touched on uh, municipalities from a municipal uh, from a fiscal perspective for municipalities, right? Um, as as properties lose their value due to flooding, you'll see lower tax revenue as the lower as the tax base uh, declines. Um, it, we could see uh, disruption to uh, normal services uh, in case of an emergency. So in, uh, again, uh, if your critical infrastructure is going to be underwater, that's going to be difficult for emergency services uh, to get where they need to go. Um, and uh, there's also been, uh, there have also been studies that have shown that uh, after a flooding disaster, uh, municipalities experience uh, increased debt. And uh, which leads to lower bond revenues, uh, which leads to all sorts of uh, all sorts of fix fiscal um, fiscal damages. Okay, so right, so there were a couple of things also that I wanted to focus on from um, 
you know, from what other what other people uh, what other people mentioned. Um, I really liked uh, Ben's presentation about gloom and doom and, and how we have to be careful about how we talk about climate change, um, that we don't want to take away people's agencies, right, agency. We don't want to say that this is happening no matter what, so there's nothing you can do about it, right? Now, there, it, there is a certain amount of climate change that is already baked into the system. I mean, even if we reduced all... Um, all emissions now, right? We would still, there's a certain amount that would still, uh, would still take place. So, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing that we can do about it, all right? And so I'm focusing less on the mitigation aspects and more on the adaptation. Um, and so, and also one of the things that I wanted to, uh, that I wanted to note, um, about uh, about Ben's presentation in particular, I like the idea of if you switch from meat to fish, it has more of an impact than switching from a Prius to a Hummer. But that doesn't mean you should trade in your Prius for a Hummer just because you eat more fish. Okay, so be careful of envir of of moral licensing, right? So okay, I just want to point that out. All right. Good. So the key here, right, we have faced these, maybe not this particular sort of disaster before, but we have faced economic disaster before or environmental disaster before, it's starting with, with, uh, with Thomas Malthus, right, who talked about how, well, if, uh, you know, if uh, f food grows linearly but population grows exponentially, we're going to face a crash, right? And so we've seen this sort of things before, these sort of doomsday scenarios that don't necessarily come to pass. The idea is we need to uh, we need to be flexible. We need to be resilient. We need to uh, we need to innovate. And so some of the policies that we need to follow uh, in order to uh, to to prevent economic disaster, right? Is we need to um, a lot of it is going to depend on how our economy uh, adapts, right? And so. You know, one of the things that um, uh, that Erin was talking about, right, is uh, she mentioned that they that uh, farmers were switching to um, more drought tolerant grasses, or uh, you know, different species, different variety selection, right. This is all about, from an economist, you know, slipping into econo speak here, um, input substitution. Right. So, can we produce many of the same things that we do uh, using different uh, using different inputs? Right. If if restaurants, for example, um, can use farmed seafood rather than than uh, than wild caught seafood, um, that might not necessarily be a great thing for those wild for the for the the fishermen out there that harvest wild caught seafood. But it would prevent, uh, or to a certain extent, it would prevent prices from rising for the, the seafood that we eat, uh, for example, right? So switching to different sorts of fuel, switching to different heating sources, right? All of that, our, our economy is, a, is not a living system, but it's a system that depends on, uh, on its adaptability. And so one of the things that we can do, I think, in Maine is we can do research and, and development in, into in, input substitution, right? What things can we use uh, instead of, you know, instead of uh, a, an input that's going to be, um, uh, going to be uh, sensitive to climate change, right? We also need to protect uh, those that are going to be most affected by that transition. Right. So, if we're talking about industries that might be affected uh, by climate change, right, we need to say, okay, well, what what policies can we put in place to protect uh, to protect those people or to help out uh, those particular industries? Um, and then, uh, finally, as an economist, I would be remiss in saying that we we need to get the prices right. Right. One of the things that got us into this uh, got us into this mess is uh, what economists call the, uh, the negative externality of, of, uh, of carbon emissions, right? Um, we don't, uh, 
the price of carbon is too low uh, to adequately reflect its, its true cost to society. So we need to increase the price of carbon. And most economists agree uh, that that is something that we need to, to do. We need to put, uh, we need to either tax carbon or we need to implement a uh, cap and trade system. Um, much like REGI, much like the regional greenhouse gas emission uh, uh, effort um, that has been so successful in Maine. And I want to say, too, that one of the reasons why it's been so successful is that the revenue raised by REGI, by this cap and trade system, uh, have gone back into um, uh, um, energy saving. Um, what's the word I'm trying to look for? Efficiency. Efficiency. Thank you. All right, good. All right, it's, uh, I got up really early to be here on time, so I, I'm fading. Okay, cool. Um, so that's basically a large kind of a, kind of a more of a bird's eye view, not, not necessarily, uh, you know, ground level, but uh, looking at different sorts of, uh, different sorts of industries, their possible impacts on climate change. Again, what we're doing here is we're, we're taking we're taking something that's very has a lot of uncertainty, a lot of tipping points, a lot of uh, you know a lot of feedback loops um, to begin with. The science is uh, you know the science is as good as we can get it. Um, you know even though it's not completely certain, you know th that doesn't mean that we should throw it out. The answer to uncertainty is more science, not less science. Right, but then you layer on top of that, um, you know, uh, economic analysis, right, and then things get a little bit more dicey, right, because you're laying uncertainty on top of uncertainty. But again, you know, the the answer to less to not imprecise science is more science, better science, right, better research, better, you know, better monitoring that sort of thing, okay? So um, what, I want to, uh, what I want to end on is sort of this, this positive note. Yes, we have, this, we have this train coming, right? But there are things that we can do to prepare us for it, all right? And, and uh, so thanks very much. So, uh, my fellow speakers to return here. Um, for some questions, I'm going to stay standing so I can manage the, the, the questions, not because I have the answers, so keep that in mind. Yes, I'm uh, Peter Monroe from uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, and I have a question for Rachel Bouvier. I figured you would be asking microphone. me a question. Hi. Yeah, well, uh, the question is, um, our group uh, favors a thing called carbon fee and dividend, yes. which is a carbon tax which returns all money to all households. And it's been demonstrated that people who have below average carbon footprints will benefit the most because they'll get an average amount of rebate at equal shares for everyone. And so that would do what you were suggesting, which is uh, helping those most uh, susceptible to damage by increased carbon pricing. Would you comment on carbon fee and dividend? Yes, certainly. Um, okay, so. There are a number of different ways of putting a uh, put, of putting an increased price on carbon. From a now again, here's where I get a little academic and wonky, so I apologize. Um, but from a theoretical perspective, it's in my opinion, it would actually be better to put uh, no. This is theoretical, actually. But from a theoretical perspective. Having a permit system might actually be better than a tax system because a permit system will actually put a quantitative limit on the amount of carbon that can be emitted, whereas a tax is a bit more uncertain because it's a price-based mechanism. However, that's, again, that's theoretical, that's not in practice. So I think in practice it might be better to have a tax system. Oops. Am I okay? All right. So, um, so there are a number of different. I think it just went out. All right. So there are a number of different ways of um, of recycling that revenue. Uh, as far as I understand, the citizens' climate lobby uh, 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 suggestion is thank you. Ha. Okay. Is to uh, to 
return that money as a uh, per family or per household dividend, right? Um, that is one of the alternatives. Uh, the other alternatives might be to, uh, to recycle that revenue by reducing uh, the capital tax rate or by reducing uh, the income tax rate. Um, and so there's actually some, uh, some very interesting uh, work that has been done by the, uh, by Resources for the Future that has actually looked at uh, kind of some of the, uh, the implications of each of those policies um, on, different, uh, on different states. Um, as far as the, the resulting distribution of, uh, of income and the resulting distribution of welfare. So it's a, it's a very interesting thing. I, um, I, uh, I fully support uh, the idea of, uh, of a carbon tax or a fee and dividend. Um, I am not, or I support the idea, I should say, of, uh, of increasing the price of carbon. Um, I am sort of agnostic on what is the best way of doing that. Great. Other questions? Sorry, I went a little long on that. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm Anna Brown. I'm with Coastal Enterprise Incorporated. Um, thanks for all of the inputs. It was really helpful to hear all of your um, presentations. I had a question which is sort of trying to move toward more solutions and um, you know, recognizing, I think a lot of the costs and benefit analyses, there's a lot of studies that have been done on impacts of climate change. The challenge is always kind of how do you bring it down to um, level of, of action and um, often there's a lot of barriers around um, the distribution of the, the co upfront costs to take action and who, who gains um, at the end. So I, I had a, the, a specific question though for you, Aaron, which is just about the crop insurance. Um, I'd just love to hear you talk a little bit more about that market and kind of what you see as um, kind of the current coverage. What, what are the kind of gaps and barriers to sort of making that product and, and perhaps others more available? Um, is it, the, do we have the right products? Um, what are the upfront uh, needs in terms of farmers being able to afford um, getting some, some coverage like that? Yeah, um, so I should explain that my job's actually uh, grant funded through the USDA Risk Management Agency, so I have kind of a unique position. I'm not funded through UMaine at all. Um, the Risk Management Agency is a branch of the USDA who oversees the federal crop insurance program. Um, and, and actually the reason that my position exists here in Maine or that the funding is available here in Maine is that um, in Maine and along up and down the Northeast, we have low enrollment in crop insurance um, among farmers, um, particularly in our region and then in um, a few states out west. So um, the thinking behind having someone like me in the state is that um, maybe farmers in Maine lack the education and the understanding about how these policies work. So maybe you know the goal is that I can shed some light um, about how this uh, tool is used as a risk management strategy. Um, but I do think the other side of the equation is that the policy options um, that we have available here in Maine aren't necessarily um, tailored to the types of farms that we have in Maine. So we have, um, you know, diversified farms here. So people growing 60 different crops, not just one to three, like you see out in the Midwest or other states where these crop insurance policies are um, really the primary risk management strategy. So in Maine and, and up and down the north, um, the coast, we see farmers managing their risks in different ways through diversification, things like irrigation and um, season extension practices and stuff. Um, but that being said, I mean, I, uh, I do think that the USDA is aware of kind of the gaps in our region specifically. Um, there are some, there is a new program specifically out there um, for diversified farms. Um, the way it works is that it's, uh, P farmers can ensure their adjusted gross revenue. Um, so it really opens up um, opportunities uh, in the way of, uh, you know, ensuring a lot of um, crops that don't have a multi peril crop insurance policy available. Um, so I, I think that that is, you know, that's the other side of the equation and, and a big reason as to why we're seeing um, low enrollment 
in our region. Um, were there any aspects of your question I didn't answer? Okay. Okay, great. I think right in front, Bill had a. You had a question. Oh, oh okay. okay. Um, hi, I'm Nancy Chandler with uh, Sierra Club and Natural Resource Council of Maine. Um, I've lived on the coast of Maine for since 1980 uh, in a harbor, small point harbor, watching the loss, the rise and loss of various industries, the urchins, the ground fishing. We have a viable lobster industry on our road. Um, and I've just taken a class at adult ed in, in Brunswick um, on the Gulf of Maine and the whole ecosystem, the ecology and the geology. And the, what I've learned from Professor Fred um, is that the only abundant species remaining in the Gulf are squid and shark. So my question for Ben Martins is how are the fishermen preparing to educate the public about these new resources to harvest and promote them because it's it's going to be a step to get us processing shark to eat it I think. Thanks. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't know uh, where your professor got the data, but uh, there's a lot out in the ocean right now. Um, and what fishermen are seeing is actually a resurgence in a lot of the species that we've traditionally caught. So um, right now at the Portland Fish Exchange, we've got pollock and haddock and cod uh, and white hake that are all coming to shore. Uh, and for a number of those species, our science has uh, doubled or tripled the allowed catch over the last few years. So we are starting to see an increase in some of our more iconic uh, species that we like to eat. Um, but there are lots of other things in our ocean that we can eat. Squid is delicious. Everybody eats calamari and loves it. Uh, and so we would love to see that, that come back. And then shellfish uh, in the inter intertidal, shellfish aquaculture um, is, is really starting to boom in our state. And as the water warms, we're also starting to see some southern New England species uh, moving up. We have a, a scallop fishery that's starting to boom in our state. And um, so there, there's lots of opportunity. And, and I think that we are seeing more sharks out in the ocean. Um, but some of that has to do more with management than climate change when it comes to what we can catch and what we, we don't catch. Let's go with one more question, Bill, right there. Hi, I have a question for Peter. Um, did you account for the recent uh, information coming from Antarctica and those uh, global sea level rise figures and graphs you showed? Yeah, that, that information actually is from uh, the so a NOAA assessment was done in 2017 that informed the last national climate assessment. Um, so there is, it is taking into account data to date by 2017 um, for Antarctica and Greenland melt. Um, accelerations in those melts are somewhat taken into account in the extreme scenarios, um, but you know because that study finished in 2017 and won't be revisited probably for another four years, um, anything that has happened since then in terms of things that we're seeing has not been incorporated into so that. The but the sure. I don't think that was included, no, it was prior to that. Um, the probability of those extreme scenarios that we saw, I think they were the eight feet for the global and then 11, close to 11 feet for New England, um, are predicated on catastrophic, I guess you could say, melting of Antarctica and Greenland. Um, so the best science at the time was incorporated, but anything since that 2017 report has not been. Please uh, join me in thanking our speakers for today. Um, we have our summer networking reception will be coming up on July 24th at Flight Deck Brewing in Brunswick. So hopefully we'll see you there and thank you all for coming.